Hello, fictional. Welcome to the What If Issei. Today we are gonna see, What If Issei Got Harem With Sona. Part 3. If you end up liking this video, please consider subscribe, so without further ado, let's get into the video. Brio picked up the receiver. Hello? Brio? Brio froze, staring at the phone's base station. This was a voice she had never expected to hear again. Dulio? Yeah hi. His voice was contrite. That did absolutely nothing to dilute her sudden spike of anger. Of all that you have some nerve. Please. Dulio's voice was frantic, urgent. It's about Daria's niece. Rio's heart stopped for a moment. An image flashed through her mind, an adorable girl with long blonde hair and green eyes, nearly the spitting image of her aunt. What's happened? She's been excommunicated, he said dully. She what and why aren't you doing something about this? Grigori moved too fast. So talk to Penny, then, Rio replied testily. Penny didn't know until I told her. Penny knows everything that happens in Grigori unless Rio trailed off. When you combined this news with what had happened to say the word schism came to mind. This would benefit absolutely no one who was sane. Unfortunately, Grigori had more than its share of people whose relationship with sanity was, at best, tenuous. Yeah. Unless. Dulio's tone was grim. Do you have her last known location? Forwarding it to your mobile now. He paused, then blurted out, I'm sorry Rio. If I could do more. Don't, Dulio. Just don't. Rio knew she was being terribly unfair. That didn't mean she could stop herself. You promised Daria. You promised her Asia Chan would be taken care of, and this is the best you can do. You think I don't know that the sheer anguish in the exorcist's voice took the wind out of her sails, and she sighed. Okay. I'll call Goru Kun, and we'll get ready. Can you call Penny? Already done. He sounded relieved, or at least like the burden wasn't just on his shoulders more. Rio paused, then said softly. Dulio be safe. Yeah. You too, Rio. I hope his say is. He's fine. As fine as can be expected. He's engaged to a devil girl now. I gotcha. Take care Rio. Click. Penryu Financial was a small but prosperous brokerage firm based in Kuo. Among its employees, Haidu Goru didn't really stand out, despite having been there since it was founded. He was senior enough to have a position that came with an office, and competent enough to keep it, but that was all that could really be said for him. He was, as far as his co-workers were concerned, just a normal middle-aged salaryman, content to while away the time at his desk half-assing paperwork and not so secretly reading fishing magazines. It would have blown their minds to realize he actually owned the joint. Like many a dragon before him, Goru eschewed the hassle of actually publicly running an organization. He settled for burying himself under several layers of proxy executives, most of whom had no idea they were glorified figureheads. Meanwhile, he drew an executive's salary and exercised stock options. It was an easy enough way to launder the wealth that a dragon's scales could reap in the supernatural markets. Goru had set up a tidy nest egg for Issei in the same way. For a while, it had looked like he and Rio would end up spending that on defense attorneys, but their son had turned things around admirably, particularly with his new fiancé's help. The fact that the two of them were fooling around under his roof every night wasn't a matter of importance. After all, both he and Rio had been up to worse when they were Issei's age, before they'd even met each other. And so it was that Tenyu Financial's real boss was reading the latest issue of Fly Fisher when his office phone rang. He hit the speaker button. Hi do here. Orukun. Rio? That was unusual for her to call directly during the day. Text or line messages were one thing, but... Pick up, please. Her tone was worried, terse, and he grabbed for the receiver. What's going on, Rio? He asked. Dulio just called, she said, and he froze for a moment. They hadn't spoken to Dulio Jesualdo in nearly three years, not since his last attempt to patch things up had resulting in Karoka destroying a Yokohama shopping arcade. He said Asia Chan's been kicked out of the church and that she's been snapped up by Grigori. Boru closed his eyes for a long moment. It took him that long to find words again. Has he talked to Penemu, then? She had no idea until he told her. And he had no idea what had happened to Asia Chan until he went to check on her. Boru forced himself to calm. It was a technique he'd been working on since he was a young dragon. By now, it usually took effect quickly. This time, it took a full minute and change. We're going after her, I assume. Julio gave me her last known location, and he's talked to Penny. She'll be opening us a circle as soon as we're ready. I'm heading home now, Goru told her tersely. I'll see you soon, she said, and hung up. Haidu Goru's co-workers were very, very surprised ten minutes later to see the normally easygoing salaryman rush out at a frantic pace, only pausing to tell his supervisor that he had a family emergency. The Leviathan, in our house. That's a little scary, Goru commented. After leaving the house, they had walked several blocks to find an alley that was typically deserted in the evenings. 
At least she approves of Issei. Yes. That certainly beats the alternative, Ryo said firmly. It could always be worse, too. Imagine if the Gremory heiress had set her sights on him too she took her bundle by the shoulder strap and looked sideways at her husband. So, about our ride. As if waiting for her words, a teleportation circle flared to life before them. And he always did have a sense of timing, Goru joked and gave his wife an after you gesture. She smirked and stepped through, her husband on her heels. The two of them emerged in a dimly lit room. Sitting there at a table was a beautiful woman with long purple hair. Her modest robes did little to obscure her voluptuous figure, a fact that both Goru and Ryo were well aware of. She rose to greet them, smiling wanly. Goru, Ryo. It's been too long. Yes, it has. Ryo embraced Penemu first, with Goru following suit immediately thereafter. Where is she? Latvia, Penemu told them, then held up a hand. Don't go rushing in there. I'm sorry, what? Goru looked at her incredulously. You want us to leave her in there? There's a reason, Penemu said. I'm almost certain that the person running this op, Rainer, is part of this schism in Grigori. This is a good chance to take her and get information out of her. Was she in Kuo last week? Ryo asked bluntly. Ryo? Penny, was she? Goru asked, quietly but insistently. It was clear he was trying to head off an explosion from his wife. Considering her background, it could be quite literal. Yes. She was, Penemu answered with equal bluntness. You'll have your shot at her, and to get Asia. I promise. But I also want you two to wait three days before striking. What? But Goru grabbed Ryo's hand, squeezing it hard until he was sure she was past the point of cratering the room. He felt brief licks of flame at his palm and gritted his teeth. Being a dragon made your human form more resistant to fire, it was true. But then, most dragons weren't married to Japan's most powerful pyrokinetic. If it looks like Asia is in serious danger, then you have my permission. Penemu's expression barely flickered, but it was clear she had at least a solid guess as to what was happening between the two of them. But it will take at least two days to shift around the forces I'll need to shut Raynor down fast and hard. I could move faster, but that would risk tipping our hand, and while she may not notice, whoever's pulling her strings probably will. You sound like you have a candidate in mind, Ryo observed, gently pulling her hand free of Gore's. She seemed to be calmer now, and her tone was more thoughtful than anything else. I do. Penemu didn't elaborate. She really didn't need to. Fine. We'll give you till Saturday morning, and if you don't move by then, we will, Ryo declared. Midnight, Zulu time. We do enjoy night maneuvers, Goru said with a smirk. Both women rolled their eyes. The mild innuendo seemed to have lightened the mood slightly, though. Midnight Zulu is fine, Ryo answered. Tell us a little more about Rainer, Goru said. As an operative and a team leader, she's very competent, Penemu explained. But she has some glaring psychological issues, mostly from an exaggerated sense of self-importance and severe control issues. She let out a reluctant sigh. Neither of those are exactly uncommon among Grigori members, I'll admit. But she takes the latter, especially, to notable heights. Her instinct is to double down, rather than admit defeat, or even that she's fallible. If you don't know her, it's easy to think she's an impulsive idiot. She snorted. Even if you do know her, it's hard not to think that. Three days worth of tracking, even with low-key assistance from Grigori and Dulio. They hadn't budged from the ruined mansion in Latvia, on the edge of the forest. Clearly, they were waiting for something, or someone. Penemu was right, Raynor was competent at running a covert op. She was also right about her control issues, judging from what Ryo had overheard from her discreet scrying spell. Mickelson won't be showing up anytime soon, Goru said dryly. The werewolf and underworld broker had been restrained in his Prague estate with the surest kind of bond beep that of a massive cash bribe. It was a drop in Grigori's bucket the actual Grigori, not whatever rogue splinter group Rainer seemed to be affiliated with. Not that that changed the shape or denomination of the suitcase full of euros. No, I suppose not, Rio agreed. Kind of as is all to donate to his retirement fund. Her phone beeped, and she checked it. Time. Well, then, I'm off. Gore rose. See you in a minute. Don't get too hot under the collar without me. Don't get all wet without me, she replied, giving him a quick kiss. With a grin, Goru leapt, assuming his draconic form, and surged upward into the night. One of the tricks that Goru had developed in fact, one of the core abilities that had earned him the nickname Black Gale, was the use of Sinjutsu in conjunction with a Japanese dragon's natural hydrokinesis. Using Kai, he was capable of hardening water droplets to a point where they were harder than lead bullets. His hydrokinetic mastery meant that, as long as there was any moisture in the air to draw from, that he would never run out of ammunition. The late night sky in this area of the Baltics was rife with moisture. He let out a thunderous roar, using the sound as a focus for the Sinjutsu. A moment later, thousands and thousands of raindrops coalesced around him. 
a moment's concentration, and they hardened, falling to the ground at just above the speed of sound. He did it five more times before diving to the ground himself, letting out another roar. By the time he was three meters above ground level, most of the rogue Grigori agents guarding the mansion were dead or incapacitated. It was far colder than Asia Argento was used to. Certainly far colder than she would have liked. She knew she was in no position to complain, though. The church had kicked her out without so much as a fairly well, not even allowing her to get word to Cousin Dulio. The Grigori recruiter had been waiting with a knowing smirk. The entire thing felt to Asia like it had been planned, but she had no idea what she could actually do about it. And so, she had spent the last three days in this ruined mansion and she thought she was still in Europe somewhere, but that was as far as she could guess. A thin bedroll and the occasional cup of Raymond was her host's idea of accommodation, while they waited for something that they weren't even bothering to tell her about. Where the hell is Selzen? This came from the fallen angel who was apparently in charge, a woman named Rainer. Asia had never seen a woman dress so skimpily of her own volition. She wondered if being dressed like that in the cold was part of why she was so ill-tempered. He's probably done a runner, Rainer. This came from another fallen angel, this one a brooding man in a trench coat and hat. Asia hadn't caught his name. He's unreliable as hell. He should still be here, Rainer groused. We have his bribe right here, after all. She turned towards Asia with a sneer, and the former nun had to suppress a shudder. This woman wasn't just ill-tempered, she was so contemptuous of everyone and everything around her. Even the trench-coated fellow, who seemed to know her well, was not fully immune from the abrasive treatment. Sadly, Asia wasn't a stranger to that kind of attitude. More than one of the church's officials exhibited something similar. And the way Rainer looked at Asia made her feel small and insignificant. There may be something else going on, too, trench coat man added. He wasn't much nicer, Asia thought, but he at least didn't indulge in Rainer's petty cruelties. We should have heard from Mickelson by now. He, at least, is reliable. Rainer made a dismissive wave. I'm not worried about him. You should be, trench coat man insisted. He is how we're going to get to the Yulin Bader site without running afoul of weight. He raised a hand to his ear as a communication circle flared to life. What is it? We're getting chopped to bits out the sentry's voice cut off with a gurgle. Lassen? Trench coat man tapped the circle, looking perplexed. He started to speak again, then he heard the sound outside and saw what was causing it through the windows. It was a black almost leaden rain falling, and the droplets were hitting the ground and their team members outside like supersonic bullets. He saw Lassen on the ground, motionless, his wings holed through and through. The half-dozen human troops in body armor with him were also on the ground. Their body armor had helped, but not enough in most cases, some of them had hold limbs, or ones that had twisted at weird angles. We need to move. Donaseek yelled, even as another rainstorm fell. This one clattered on the rooftop like hail. They were on the ground floor, but enough of that would pierce the ceiling and the floors above. What the hell? Rainer screeched. Rather than alarmed or worried, she sounded put out, like a child denied her sweets. Who's doing that? Her reaction, Asia thought, wasn't reassuring. It doesn't matter. The male fallen angel shot back. Grab the nun and head for the forest. We'll set up for a teleportation circle once we're through the tree line. The ground-shaking thump rattled the mansion, throwing the fallen angels to their knees. Asia hadn't even managed to stand, so she was unaffected. A moment later, a sound like an angry jet engine blew in half the house's windows, peppering the three of them with shattered glass. Asia gingerly shook her tunic free of the shards. Who's funking with us? Rainer growled. What part of it doesn't matter don't you understand? Trench coat man cried out in exasperation. Asia almost felt sorry for him. Grab the girl and wheel. The front doors blew inward and a massive creature poked its head in. The same word fell, unbidden, from the lips of the house's last three occupants. Dragon. Good, you're not complete idiots. The dragon spoke in a strangely familiar accent. Leave the girl. Asia's eyes widened. What on earth would a dragon want with her? Screw why Rainer started to spit out, but trench coat man bodily shoved her through the door, pushing her in the direction of the tree line. The handful of remaining Grigori agents followed suit. The dragon turned its eyes on Asia, and she gulped. There were stories the church told about dragons, about them being greedy and lustful creatures who were nevertheless too powerful to defy needlessly. But there were other stories Aunt Daria had told her. As she stared, the dragon changed. When it was finished changing, she was staring at a man perhaps a few years older than her, with spiky brown hair and glasses. At least, he looked close to her age until she saw his eyes, those eyes had seen decades of both joy and sorrow. Something about him was familiar, too, though she couldn't quite put a finger on why. He wore a heavy winter coat and cargo pants and had a kind look on his face. Are you alright? He asked. So? You're the one who tried to kill my son. Who the funk are you? Rainer sneered. 
the woman was a youthful 40-something, with brown hair gathered at the nape of her neck and a long ponytail. She was dressed sensibly, even plainly, as if she were off to the market, instead of engaged in a life anti struggle. Around them, the dozen survivors of her team, including a heavily bruised Donasik, tensed for action. They hadn't quite made it to the tree line, after all. I do Rio, she said simply. Am I supposed to grovel and beg forgiveness? Raynor couldn't believe the woman's gall. Saying that to a fallen angel, expecting to be treated like a real person. Who did she think she was? It might help your friends, Rio said thoughtfully. Not you, though. She snapped her fingers. Rainer was suddenly thrown back by an explosion of eye-burning blue-white flame. Out of the corner of her eye, she could see the same thing happening to her allies. She started to rise to her feet, but another explosion knocked her back down, this one actually left her scorched and jarred. Yet another explosion knocked her flat on her back before she could even start to stand. The sudden spike of pain in her left leg suggested that it was broken. She saw Donaseek spread his wings and try to take to the sky, but yet another blue-white explosion took him 10 meters off the ground. He fell to the ground, twitching and groaning. And there was no sign of the typical magical casting circle anywhere. To the hell she ground out, forcing herself to her feet. I guess you can't take a hint, Rio said, shaking her head. Try this, then. All at once, that same fire was wreathing her, burning hot enough that Rainer, who was a good 10 meters away now, was getting a second degree burn just looking at her. 20 years melted away from her features, and her housewife's clothes were replaced by a lavender kimono. She reached out her left hand, and a tachi shaped from that very blue flame appeared. She curled her fingers around the hilt and assumed Chidano Kami. Akaji Haim. Donasik groaned, from where he lay, dazed and burned. Rainer, this is serious. It can't be Rainer whispered disbelievingly. The Azure Conflagration Princess was reputedly the Shinto faction's strongest fire mage, a member of the Five Great Families and, at one point, a holy swordswoman. She was supposed to be semi-retired now, but at one point she had been rumored to be Kyoto's most feared magical enforcer. Even now, she was supposedly a close confidant of Yasaka's. Hyperbole be damned, whatever the story said, they all agreed that she was definitely not someone to be funked with lightly. And Rainer had tried to kill her son. For a moment, realization and horror threatened to overwhelm Rainer. But then she bared her teeth in a defiant snarl. Doubling down had become her coping mechanism over the passage of centuries, so ingrained as a habit that she had stopped thinking about it long ago. It didn't matter that it was often counterproductive or that it often complicated her relationships with her allies. No, it allowed her to continue feeling in control and enabled her to avoid ever admitting she was wrong. Nothing else mattered. The day would be no different. You're no match for me, bitch. She screamed at Rio. I'll gut you like I should have gutted your stupid brat. Bring it on, then, Rio replied, the coolness of her tone a striking contrast to the heat of her flames. I was warned that you were pig-headed, but I thought they were exaggerating. Rainer manifested and hurled several spears of light at the mage, then followed herself with a glowing crimson falchion, doing her best to ignore the pain in her left leg. Her lips skinned back from her teeth in a grotesque smile. This bitch might have some meager skill, but she was no match for a fallen angel. She managed to maintain that monstrous grin, even as the mage's blue flames absorbed and dissipated her spears. It began to falter as Haidu's weapon parried her falchion with ease. The woman's cool expression just pissed Rainer off more, and she started screaming at her, pressing the attack despite her increasing ineffectualness. Haidu sidestepped one particular reckless lunge. Her blade flicked out once, twice, with surgical precision, and Rainer sank to her knees, her back light with searing agony. My wings, she whispered, then screamed, my wings. She jolted as she felt that same searing heat hover at the back of her neck. Even though the flame sword's blade wasn't quite touching her skin, its elemental keenness felt like a straight razor teasing her skin. Ahem. The voice wasn't Haidu's. She knew it well, though. It was very nearly the last voice whose owner she wished to be present right now. Rio. You're late, Penny, Haidu said tersely, and Rainer inwardly cringed. That confirmed it. If Grigori's chief secretary was here, there was no way Azazel was unaware. I needed a word or two with the Governor General, Penemu said calmly. She wasn't alone, either, nearly three dozen other Grigori agents, all of them armed and unhappy, were securing the transfer site. She gave Rainer a disgusted look, and the latter tried to muster the wherewithal to glare back. It didn't quite take. What do you think you're doing, though? She tried to kill Issei, Haidu said flatly, and Penemu grimaced. Rainer could not wrap her head around this how did a human mage, even one as vaunted as the Akaji Haim, presume to be on such casual terms with one of Grigori's cadre. It's done. She's defeated, Penemu answered, in that same calm tone Rainer despised. She summoned a magical circle, starting a healing spell, and Rainer felt the magical energy easing her pain and repairing her wounds. Not that she felt an ounce of gratitude for that. 
leave her to us. We'll make sure she receives the proper punishment. I'll hold you to that, Hyde you said. The veiled threat should have sounded ridiculous coming from a mere human, but somehow it didn't. Is that a threat or a promise? Penham you retorted wryly. Rayner looked back and forth between the other two women. No. She couldn't possibly be picking up an undertone of innuendo. I presume Goru has Asia Chan secured. Yes, Haidu said, and her voice sharpened. I trust there'll be no problem with her staying with us, then. None. Dulio and I spoke with the Governor General regarding that. Consider it an apology for this unpleasantness. Her voice softened. How is it say? Doing well, thank you. No thanks to that bitch. There was a soft sound like a breeze, and Rayner felt the heat from the blue-white flames fade away. He's a devil now, engaged to the Citri heiress. That's quite a turnaround. Well, I wish them the best of luck. I imagine that the Leviathan will do her best to hurry him along to high class. Enough with the mutual admiration society. Rayner couldn't help blurting out, and it was all she could do not to recoil at the combined glare from the other two women. Penemu spoke first. Go ahead and take Asia Chan home, Rio. I think I'll have my hands full with this one for the time being. I'll leave it to you, Penemu, Hyde you answered. Don't be too gentle with her. Erg you won't get away with this Rainer managed. Some small atrophied part of her pointed out that she was acting reckless as hell right now. That part was easily ignored by the rest of her. You and your stupid son. You really are an idiot, aren't you? Hyde you shook her head almost pityingly, then turned and strode away. She may just be right, Penem you added, narrowing her eyes at Rainer. Why don't you start telling me just what you were up to here? It might just keep you out of Cossidus. Her eyes glinted coolly. Might. Asia Chan, I presume? Yes, she answered hesitantly. Have we met? A long time ago, he told her, unzipping his coat. He doffed it, leaving himself in a thick sweater, and wrapped it around her shoulders. My name's Goru. My wife and I were friends of your Aunt Daria. A haunted look flitted through his eyes as he said the name. Aunt Daria Asia hadn't thought of her aunt in years. Even now, her mind shied away from her memory. Too much about her was entangled in memories of happier times that could never be regained. Like the church, now. Julio told us what happened to you, Goru continued. We're here to take you home with us. We'll make sure you're safe and taken care of. He smiled wanly. Asia tightened her grip on the coat, standing carefully in the recage of the house's foyer. She looked around at the recage the battle had left in the forest and the way the moon shone brightly in the cold, clear night sky. Finally, she turned back to face the man and nodded, returning his wan smile. She bowed awkwardly. Thank you, Goru-san. That's fine, he said, looking faintly abashed. He then raised his voice, calling out, Rio. Humming. A moment later, a beautiful woman with long brown hair emerged from the remaining tree line. She wore a lavender kimono. Like her companion, she was somehow familiar to Asia. She raised a hand in greeting as she approached and offered Asia a smile of her own. Asia Chan. Good, you're safe. We've met too, haven't we? Asia gave her a bow as well, this one a little less awkward. Yes, we have. I'm Rio, Gorukun's wife. That same pained look flashed through her eyes as well. He asked you to come home with us. Yes, Asia said with a nod. She clutched the tattered carriel that contained all her belongings in the world and fixed a determined expression on her face. I'm ready. Gora nodded. He stretched and changed. Scales sprouted out, his body shifted and lengthened. When he was finished, a blue-black eastern dragon rested on its haunches in the clearing. In the back of her mind, Asia remembered stories her aunt had told about a kind dragon who saved lost children. Just climb aboard, it rumbled in a basso version of Gora's voice. It's a long flight back to Kuo. Rio, I trust you have something prepared for that. Yes, I do. Rio turned towards Asia, helping her climb onto Gora's back before vaulting aboard easily. As she settled behind the younger woman, she cast a basic climate control spell. Just stick close and we'll stay warm, she assured Asia. We'll be home before you know it. Oh Asia thought about the word and nodded with a slight smile. I'm Asia Argento. I hope we all get along. Asia dimpled at her new classmates, drawing ooze and awe of admiration. The fact that she was not at all deliberately working the room only made her more endearing to them. Essay shot her an approving look and leaned back in his chair, resuming reading the essay he'd been perusing beforehand. Meanwhile, Asia was getting mobbed by the other students, all asking probing questions. Inevitably, the topic turned towards where she was living, and more than a dozen jealous faces turned to glare at Issei. Aika, Kaori, and Riya looked more amused than anything else, as well they might. Riya had helped Issei and Sona tutor Asia for the entrance exams, while Kaori and Aika had met her earlier that morning. Ice. Mitsuda demanded. What's the meaning of this, Asia Chan living with you? She's the relative of a family friend, Issei replied in a distracted tone. Can you keep it down? I'm reading here. 
Who cares about that? Motohama said dismissively. Just what do you think you're up to with her, huh? Studying. Issei said this as if it were self-evident. Ask Ria-san, she and Sona-san were both over on Sunday helping her study. Yep, Ria agreed. You would have been bored to tears. Especially when he and Kaichu got off on a tangent about computers. Okay, I can actually believe that, Mitsuda said reluctantly. At the disbelieving looks from their classmates, he explained, Ice has been a big computer nerd since middle school. If the Kaichu is a big nerd too. There was some quiet rumbling about the third most popular girl in school being called a nerd, and it was finally Mitsuda and Motohama's turn to be in the hot seat for a while. True to form, they were completely clueless as to how anything they'd said could have earned them trouble. Issei mouthed a thank you at Ria and resumed reading. It had been a while since the last time he'd reread homesteading the newsphere. The sudden sound of thunder snagged his attention, and he glanced outside, wincing as he saw the sudden downpour. Aw, oh, crap, he sighed. Hope that doesn't last too long. Aika was checking her phone, and she shook her head. Don't hold your breath. Looks like we're in for it all week. Fiba stood in the middle of the abandoned mansion's living room and concentrated. A moment later, the house rumbled as a dozen swords appeared, driven point down into the ruined carpet around him. The weather being what it was, they were making the best of things, and it wasn't like the mansion's interior was in in decent condition, anyway. It made for good close quarters training, anyway. The Gremory heiress's knight relaxed, looking over at Issei and Kaori. Please, take a look to see if there's any swords there that's suitable for you too. Thanks for doing this, Kiba, Issei said, giving him a thumbs up. He strolled among the swords for several minutes, picking up several of them to test how they felt in his grip. Finally, he selected one that resembled a Chinese Dao. I like the feel of this one, he announced. It's no problem, Kiba answered. It's a chance to hone my skills with my sacred gear. He looked curiously at Issei and Kaori. I must confess I'm surprised that the rest of your peerage isn't here today. Aichu thought it was best that we see you about borrowing weapons and practicing in close quarters, Kaori said. She smiled her thanks at Kiba and started perusing the swords as well. Five minutes of experimentation brought her to a saber-like blade, and she smiled as she tested it in Renzoku Waza. Yes. I think this will do nicely. I'm still surprised you didn't stick with Meguri's katana, Issei noted. I didn't feel quite right about borrowing it, Kaori explained. And the way Kaichu was talking, it also sounded like I shouldn't get too attached to any one weapon just yet. There is a certain advantage to avoiding overspecialization with a single weapon, Kiba noted. It avoids canny opponents developing countermeasures. He waved a hand, and the remaining swords dissipated. But then, my sacred gear makes it easy to do that. The Kaichu may have something in mind for you, and this way you'll have fewer habits to unlearn. That sounds like something Sona ch I mean, Sona Kaichu would do, Issei agreed. Can your sacred gear do anything with these? Kaori wondered, glancing at Issei. It lets you control objects made from iron, right? Are demonic swords ferrous, though? Issei mused. Let's find out he set his new weapon on the ground and stepped back several paces. He then held out a hand towards it, concentrating, trying to will it to come to him. The blade flew at him, slamming itself by the flat into his stomach before clattering to his feet. He stumbled back, unwounded, but the wind knocked out of him. Wincing as he recovered his breath, he looked at the other two devils, who were struggling not to laugh. Well, they're Ferris, all right, he told them hoarsely. Kiba recovered first, trying to look philosophical. At least it looks useful for disarming an opponent, he offered. And given how many weapons are at least partially made of iron, it would be effective against most opponents. Kaori finally regained her composure. Clearing her throat, she nodded in agreement with Kiba. Why don't you try disarming me, then? She tightened her grip on the saber's hilt. We'll see how long it takes you. Enough already. Cut it out. Well, let go of the stupid thing, then. Kiba watched in amusement as Issei literally dragged Kaori electromagnetically back and forth across the massive living room. She had a death grip on her saber's hilt and had her heels dug in, but it was clearly being drawn to the rook, who was magically pulling it with all his might. Had they been outside and the weather clear, it would have looked like some very inefficient field tilling. Do I even want to know what's happening here? Ria's asked in bemusement. Believe it or not, this is training, Kiba explained. He's trying to disarm her, and she's trying to keep hold of her sword. So it's not some weird kind of flirting, Kaneko said skeptically. I don't think so, Kiba said, although he looked like he wasn't sure. Issei finally managed to wrench the saber free of Kaori's grip, sending it flying. Said saber went spinning towards Ria's and her servants, who had to backpedal quickly to avoid it. Sorry about that. He called out and then squawked as Kaori collided hard with him. Hey. That hurt. She scolded him and looked around for her sword before seeing it lying at Kiba's feet. She scurried over, retrieving it without a word, and pointed it at Issei. Okay, we're sparring now. 
The saber's blade was suddenly wreathed in demonic energy. Fine by me. Issei shot back, and his own blade was suddenly surrounded by blue-white flames. Bring it he began backpedaling rapidly as she leapt at him and brought it. He seemed to block her strikes handily enough, but she was pressing him too hard for him to get the initiative. This time, the knight was driving the rook around the living room. Oddly enough, both of them were grinning like idiot. You're absolutely sure Kaneko started. I'm sure it's not just some weird kind of flirtation, all right. Kibo mended. Meanwhile, in the center of the room, Issei had finally managed to drive Kaori back enough to get some traction and was now chasing her, swinging his fiery Dao wildly. Right. Well, I think I'm going to go work on reports, Ria said, her tone clearly saying not my peerage, not my problem. All Kiba could do was shrug in response and watch the servants of his mistress's friend rival. At least they were having fun, he thought philosophically. Welcoming Asia to Kuo really was a flimsy excuse for a party, but no one was complaining. Inevitably, the discussion wandered towards what to do, and Ria and Aika were rather vocal about bowling. Lacking any better ideas, Sona agreed, and the student council and their notional guest of honor crowded into a lane at the local rec center. At the last minute, the orc president invited herself and her peerage along, and the impromptu party agreed to take over four lanes and dominate the snack bar. The idea of kicking them out never occurred to the manager. Between the amount of snacks they were buying and the fact that they were better behaved than many of the usual students who came in from Kuo, they were the best customers she'd seen that month. Hey. Issei nudged Sona gently. The two of them were awaiting their turns and nibbling snacks while they did so. If they happened to be quietly playing footsie with each other, no one noticed or said anything. You see that? Tsona followed his eyes to Tsubaki. The tall, elegant student council vice president was talking to Kiba at the bowl return or trying to. Their conversation was polite but awkward, and the Bishounin who was so beloved by Kuo's student body was absolutely oblivious. Yes, I see, Sona told Issei with a slight smile. She's been interested in him for quite some time. How does he not see it? He said in an exasperated tone. We all have our blind spots, she replied in a gently pointed tone and softened her smile to cushion her words slightly. Besides, Kibasan probably thinks that acknowledging one girl's affections would make the others jealous of her. Yeah, but it's Tsubaki Fukakechu, Issei said. What are they gonna do, snub her? You have something in mind. Sona's tone made it a statement rather than a question. Issei pursed his lips. He felt slightly surprised at the statement but realized she was right even if he hadn't fully assembled the thought. Ask me after we're done here? He suggested. Sure. Sona looked amused. Have a chance to think some more? Sona asked as they walked back to her apartment after seeing Asia back to his house. The rain had lightened slightly to a steady drizzle, but that was still sufficient excuse for the two of them to share an umbrella and walk in close proximity to each other. Tsubaki walked with the two of them under her own umbrella, she and Sona had put off some paperwork in favor of the party and it needed doing. Yeah, I think so, Issei said, shifting the umbrella slightly so that Sona got a little more coverage. Her command of aquakinesis made getting wet a momentary inconvenience, but the sentiment was nice. Why don't we start getting together with the orc for social things? Karayak, bowling, something like that. Sona raised an eyebrow. What do you have in mind? Issei shrugged. Truth be told, it seemed like he was coming up with this as he went. Mostly what's the word? Creating goodwill, making sure we get along and work well together? that kind of thing. He snuck a sideways look at Tsubaki. For example, suppose we get Tsubaki Fukakechu and Kiba talking about weapons training, spark some ideas there. Fostering stronger ties with the other peerage in Kuo is probably a good idea, Tsubaki chimed in. She was doing an admirable job of keeping her voice level far better than she was doing at suppressing a blush. Tsona suppressed a smile. It was a rather transparent attempt to play matchmaker on Issei's part, not that she could fault his motives. And both he and Tsubaki were right, just as she and Rhea's friendship generally took precedence over their rivalry, so did their peerage's ability to cooperate take precedence over Anupsmanship. If you two are willing to organize the events and coordinate with Rhea's, I'll allow it. Certainly, as long as Haidu Kuhn is willing to work with me. Tsubaki tried to sound cool and collected. To someone who didn't know her, she probably would have succeeded. Definitely. Issei nodded enthusiastically and grinned. Maybe next time, we can do Karayak. He gave Sona a meaningful look. And maybe I'll actually get you to sing something one of these nights. The right song, on the right night, perhaps. Sona's cheeks pinked slightly, but she let herself smile. Tuesday. Tuesday's activities were relatively light, focusing on light combat training and getting Tomo and Tsubasa used to their new sacred gears. Aika was finding geokinesis to be one of her particular talents. 
Combining this with Momo and Ria's bishop talents enabled the three of them to raise a sizable earthen shelter with a, mostly, watertight roof to work under. It was just as well, today's rainfall was harder and more persistent. At least the occasional puddles that go through the roof were good training for footwork and situational awareness. Issei's fellow rook was already enjoying the boost in speed momentum pillage gave her when facing other opponents. Certainly, only Issei's pyrokinesis had kept her from making total mincemeat of him in their sparring. Even with it well, he was glad he'd worn a plain t-shirt for practice today. Those cost less to replace. Meanwhile, Tamo was acclimating to the capabilities of Mind's Edge rather quickly, producing an amethyst-hued photokinetic blade and prompting the inevitable lightsaber jokes from Issei and Ria. Right now, she and Kaori were sparring their way around the mansion's lawn, and she had the sacred gear shaped into an ajinata. She and Kaori seemed to be pretty evenly matched as far as skill went, but Mind's Edge was giving Tamo a pretty decisive advantage, even with the demonic sword Kiba had loaned the Kandoka. Issei and Sona were watching, drinking from bottles of water as they did. Sacred gears sure are something, the rook said wonderingly. Sona nodded. This peerage is very unusual in that it has five sacred gear bearers. Issei looked sideways at her. Basa-chan, Meguri, and me that's only three. Actually, it'll be best to show you, Sona said, and then called out, Tsubaki. Saji-kun. Come here for a moment, please. Humming, Kaichu. Saji trotted over, clearly eager to please. Tsubaki followed at a slightly more sedate pace. I'd like both of you to show Issei-kun your sacred gears, please, Sona said. It'll be good if everyone in the peerage who has one knows about the others. That'll improve our ability to use them in concert to the best effect. Tsubaki nodded. Saji looked less enthused, but nodded as well. Both of them drew a deep breath. A moment later, a bracer shaped like a cartoonish dragon's head appeared strapped to Saji's wrist. Meanwhile, a full-length mirror appeared next to Tsubaki, and she rested a hand atop its frame. Mine is called Mirror Alice, Tsubaki explained. It lets me turn my opponent's attacks back on them, at double strength. And mine is called Absorption Line, Saji said proudly. It's one of four made from the imprisonment of the prison dragon Vritra and allows me to drain power from his opponents and transfer it to my allies. Why is it called the prison dragon? Issei asked interestedly. For some reason, it seemed as though the fate of the dragon interested him a little more than Saji's sacred gear. Centuries ago, the Hindu deities warred against their enemies, the Asuras, Saji answered, slightly surprised by the question. In the process, Indra defeated Vritra and his soul was divided between several sacred gears. Hardly seems fair, Issei noted. It sounded like he sympathized more with the dragon than with the gods. It wasn't an unreasonable feeling, Sona thought wryly. The gods rarely are, Issei-kun, she said aloud, her tone slightly sour. I guess not, he conceded. Both of those sound pretty useful, then. Wish mine did a little more good in a straight-up fight, though. Saji seemed like he wanted to say something snide. Instead, after a quelling look from both Sona and Tsubaki, he muttered, the more you work with it, the better an idea you'll have of how to use it. He's correct, Sona agreed. It's all about figuring out how to apply its abilities. You've already figured out how to disarm opponents even if it needs some fine-tuning, she added with an affectionate smirk. I'm sure you'll be able to figure out how to weaponize it. I guess so. Issei's voice abruptly took on a faraway tone, and Sona looked quizzically at her fiancé. Issei-kun. Um. Sorry. It's what you said, about weaponizing it that rang a bell, but I can't quite chase the thought down. It'll come back to you, she said encouragingly. She knew all about stray thoughts and epiphanies and how trying to nail them down just made them fly away faster. Let it be for now. You do know me too well, Sona-chan, he said, chuckling helplessly and rubbing the back of his head. He'd said it softly enough that no one else had heard, so Sona reached out and squeezed his free hand. It was really remarkable how quickly both of the had come to rely on simple affectionate touches. Why don't we try some demonstrations? Tsubaki quickly suggested, cognizant of the sudden thunderclouds in Saji's expression. You'll get a more visual idea of what we can do. Sona nodded in approval. Issei-kun, go ahead and summon your pyrokinesis. Saji-kun, try sapping his flames so he doesn't get too injured when Tsubaki redirects them. The two young men mumbled assent. Issei shaped his hands into finger guns and called forth his blue-white flames. At the same time, Saji shot out a glowing tendril into the fire. At first, Issei didn't feel any different. Then his flames started flickering and stuttering. A mildly queasy sensation accompanied that. I see what you mean about this, he said, his tone a little woozy. That feels like it's messing with my inner ear balance. Now you see why the prison dragon's sacred gears are feared, Saji told him. He sounded less smug than Issei would have expected. I guess so, he agreed. Keep this up, I'll actually be sick. Now try aiming a wreck a dan or two at Mirror Alice, Sona instructed. No more. 
I don't want you to actually get banged up. That's fine, I don't want me to get banged up either, Issei replied lightly. He aimed his finger guns at Tsubaki's sacred gear and fired. The normally eye-burning blue-white flames were far weaker this time, but they still struck the mirror with what should have been enough force to knock an opponent ass over to Kettle. Instead, they streaked into the glass without even a ripple on the reflective surface. A moment later, they came flying back out a close to full power, way too fast to essay to dodge. He had just enough time to throw his arms up in a blocking move before the flames struck him. He went skidding backwards into the rain, dropping to one knee and completely blowing out the knees of his jeans before he could stop. Tsona moved quickly to his side, looking him over with a clinical demeanor that might have fooled complete strangers. At least you're not burned, she said absently, checking the state of his bruises and scrapes. Pyrokinetics generally have a high heat resistance, but there are some who don't. It's an interesting omission when it happens. I'm sure they have a different word for it than interesting Issei replied, his tone philosophical. Think I'm okay. These clothes are shot, though. Well, maybe I can turn the jeans into shorts. We'll clean you up first thing when we're done here. Sona pulled him gently to his feet and tugged him back towards the makeshift shelter. You have a clearer picture of what they're capable of, now. Yeah, I think so, Issei said, looking over at Tsubaki and Saji. Thanks. You know, maybe sometime we should work on combined attacks. Using Saji's thing to soften up an opponent before piling on. We could do that sometime, Saji said, trying not to sound too mulish. Agreed, Tsubaki said thoughtfully. It may be some time before we enter a raiding game, but this would be helpful for real-world tactics. Sona nodded her approval and spoke up, raising her voice. Good work today, everyone. Let's leave it there for now. She shifted her gaze towards her fiancé. Issei Kuhn, you're at my place tonight, correct? Yeah, if that's all right, Issei answered. He wondered if all newlyweds felt weird giddiness at sharing a private space together, even if they had certain strings attached and weren't technically newlyweds yet. Why don't you let me make dinner? He offered. I can actually make shabu shabu. I will take you up on that, she said with an eager nod. Shabu shabu. Head snapped up around the field, faces suddenly alight with interest. Even Saji and Tsubaki perked up at the thought. Sona looked around at the suddenly expectant faces and smiled ruefully. I suppose we'll have dinner guests. You good with cooking for that many? Oh, I suppose, Issei answered with a wry grin. Not right away, though. I really should get cleaned up first. We'll take care of that first. Sona's soft, slight smile seemed to suggest a long, hot shower together. After that, go ahead to the store, and she suddenly looked thoughtful. And then, I'll need to talk to Ria's about something really quick. She looked at the rest of her peerage, Kaori and Aika in particular. Please be at my place in 90 minutes. This might be a good chance to introduce you to the rating games. Thank you for letting me borrow these, Ria's. Sona tucked the DVDs into her school bag. She'd have preferred not to rush back out immediately after she and Issei had gotten out of the shower, but it was important for the night's plans, and he had needed to go to the market anyway. If it helps you, it helps me, Ria's replied with a smile. So this is how you're going to introduce your new servants to the raiding games, hmm? It is a bit like throwing them into the deep end, Sona admitted. But if they can start thinking about how to deal with Riser and Sererg, any other likely opponents will be fairly simple. And we shouldn't have to worry about the former in the near future. She gave Ria's a dry look that wasn't entirely free of pleading. A couple of months, at least, would be nice. I know, I know. Ria's made a slight mouth at the gentle badgering. So far, my family hasn't said anything about Riser pushing to move the date up. Let's hope that trend continues. Sona stifled a yawn. Pardon me. I didn't think your peerage was training that late, Ria's noted. She then gave Sona another closer look, and her smile turned teasing. I also don't remember you owning that many computer humor t-shirts. The Seikun's shirts are comfortable, and they smell like him, Sona replied. Despite the slight flush to her face, she said the words bluntly. It felt oddly freeing to be open about being with and desiring Issei. And I cut us off specifically so we could have dinner and watch these. He's making shabu shabu. Shabu shabu? Ria's perked up. Let me grab my coat. Wait, I didn't. I promise not to side eye you two if you start getting cozy. Are you just angling for free food? Sona quipped. Well, since you're loaning the recordings all right. All right, give us some room, Issei said as he, Ria, and Tsubasa carried the shabu shabu and fixings out to the living room. The rest of Sona's peerage was already gathered there, while Sona was loading a DVD into the player. The council president sat next to her fiancé and waited until everyone was settled in before reaching for the remote. Between the hot food, the full living room, and the sound of steady rainfall outside, Sona's apartment felt extra cozy and home-like tonight. These are what you were talking about last week? Aika asked, her tone one of asking for confirmation. 
Yes, Sona replied with a nod. Good performance in the rating games is currently the fastest way of improving one's status in devil society. Ranking in the games also constitutes a benchmark for the power and skill of a high-class devil's peerage. Issei snorted in wry amusement and gave Ria's a sideways look. He was both amused and exasperated that she'd invited herself along when Sona had mentioned dinner. So this is what you were talking about when I came to ask about devil courtship. Ria's just grinned. If it's any consolation, you threw me completely for a loop when you came in asking if chess was related to it in any way. All of us were floored. She chuckled. I think Akeno was most surprised when you didn't even flinch at her attempt to flirt with you. That does make me feel better, Issei admitted. Ah, I hope she didn't take it personally. You needn't worry for your life, Ria's told him with a wicked grin. Endless teasing, now, that's probably still on the table. Whose rating game are we watching? Tsubaki wondered as she began to dish herself up some dinner. We have two recordings on hand, Sona explained. Riser Phoenix and Sarayard Bale. We'll start with Risers. She looked at her peerage. They're high-class devils whose peerages have an excellent reputation in the games. It's not inconceivable that we could be facing them in the future. So, pay attention between bites. That might be difficult, Tsubasa commented blithely. This is great, Ice-chan. Kaichu, try it. Sona did so, and she made a pleased sound. Issei Kun, this is very good. She took another, larger helping, before hitting play. Thanks, he said, blushing slightly. Dig in, everyone. I got enough for seconds and maybe thirds. As he dished himself up a plate, he mused, Ka Sen taught me to make this much. Two Sen eats like he's a dragon or something. Dot. For a long time, the gathered students chowed down, conversation at a virtual standstill as they watched the TV. Aika was the first one to break the silence, and her comment succinctly summed up the general reaction. This riser guy is a real asshole. Kinda hot, but his attitude just ruins it for me. Yes, he is an asshole, Ria's agreed, her eyes narrowed as she watched the screen. Sona and I are acquainted with him. He's even harder to deal with in person. She shook her head. My parents and his are friends, in fact. And his parents are actually fairly nice. I have no idea how he turned out the way he has. Sona glanced at her peerage. As a person, he's a walking example of how a king should not treat their peerage or anyone else, really. Unfortunately, he has some talent at gathering and managing skilled servants. She sipped at her drink before continuing. It's possible to learn things from the latter trait. Is he seriously referring to himself in the third person? Kaori asked incredulously. That's part of why he's even harder to deal with in person, Tsubaki commented, looking weary at the thought. Ah, Haidu-kun, is there any more of the sweet tea? Yeah, it's the jug in the fridge. Want me to? No, no, I'll get it. I'll just bring it out, if that's okay. Sure, go ahead. Issei returned his eyes to the screen. He's a pyrokinetic too. Yes, Sona confirmed. It's one of his family's specialties, in the same way that hydrokinesis is a citri specialty. So is immortality that is to say, he can heal from virtually any injury very quickly. So Phoenix isn't just a clever name, Aika said dryly. Sadly, no. Sona took another drink. Reportedly, he's grown out of the third person thing, Ria's commented. I'll believe it when I see it. Once again, they lapsed into silence as they watched an eight. How do you fight that? Him, I mean. Ria wondered aloud. The rest of his peerage is manageable. Especially the little nut jobs with the chainsaws. But his powers are. His current record is at 9-2, but both losses were against allies of his family. It's very likely he threw those matches, Ria's answered. Still, his personality presents certain blind spots. A smart peerage can exploit those. I'll get you recordings of his other games, Sona. It sounds like you two really expect us to go up against him soon, Issei observed. It's not out of the question, Sona answered obliquely, exchanging glances with Rias. Issei gave his fiance a curious look, and she responded with one that promised later clarification. Wednesday. Hey, hi do senpai. Hmm. Kaori looked up as Issei turned to look at the speaker. It was the first year with turquoise hair and twin braids, Nagahama Mitsun. She was well aware that the younger girl was considered one of the great beauties of her year. Issei was being careful to keep his eyes above her neck. That made the knight feel oddly proud. Um, hi Nagahama. What can I do for you? Maybe, Nagahama said. Kaori tensed slightly and wondered if the other girl noticed it. You're good with computers, right? The first year started fidgeting in a way that would normally draw male attention to her chest, which was fairly impressive. Even the fact that Issei was aware of them bothered her, although she was still glad he was keeping his eyes level. Pretty good, Issei acknowledged. He was now going out of his way to find the wall fascinating. She wondered if anyone else even noticed. Is there a problem with yours? Yeah, she said, smiling at him. 
This was weird, especially after she'd spent the last week glaring suspiciously at him. Could you take a look at it? Sure, he said quickly. Programming club meets on Tuesdays and Fridays. Why don't you bring it by tomorrow and I'll take a look at it? Bring it to school. Nagahama sounded disappointed. Yes, I think bringing it to school would be the best idea, Kaori interjected quickly. Her tone was friendly but firm. We wouldn't want anyone to think anything weird was going on, would we? Her smile was just a little bit knowing. After all, isn't that what people would think if Haibu came to your house all alone? Nagahama jolted, surprise on her face. Clearly, the game was up. No, of course not, she said quickly. Well, why don't you just bring it by when you can, Issei suggested slowly, looking back and forth between the two of them. Sure. Thanks, Murayama senpai, Haidu senpai. Nagahama went back to her sparring partner, and Issei turned to his peerage mate. Was that what I thought it was? He said softly. Yep. Kaori spoke with dry amusement. Honestly, I was expecting Yui to act first. And I'm honestly a little disappointed. I was expecting something more subtle from Nagahama. Issei rolled his eyes. I suppose they've never heard the words entrapment before. Kaori snorted softly in wry amusement. Probably not. Well, that was good thinking, anyway. Hope it doesn't get you in trouble with the rest of the club, though, he said sincerely. Probably not, she assured him. Right now, they're still mostly relieved that it's me dealing with you, and not them. I'm hoping some of them start opening their eyes soon, though. She smirked slightly. Believe it or not, I think Nagahama might be one of the first. Issei raised both eyebrows, starting to speak, but his attention was snagged by Shizuku calling out. All right, people, good practice today. Haidu, Murayama, you've got cleanup today. Yes, but you, they chorused. I'll get the shinai if you open the equipment room. Issei offered. Sure, Kaori said. She unlocked the storage room and gathered the discarded gear. As they entered the storage room, she asked curiously, something I've been wondering for a while why a harem. Issei looked at her in surprise, nearly dropping the gathered shinai. What? You've been talking about wanting one for a few years now, right? It seemed very important to Kaori that she understood what made Issei tick. Especially since her mind shied away from that for the moment. I get the male fantasy thing, but you seem to be chasing after one pretty hard for a while. Like a shark chasing after blood or something. Would you believe me if I said I wasn't really sure? Issei told her. Ah, do the shinase go in this rack or that one? The one over there, please thank you. And I would believe it, but that makes it even stranger. Like some kind of of mysterious compulsion, she replied. If it was just an idle fantasy, I don't think you'd have bothered. I guess not, he agreed, then sighed. Well, there is a reason, but it's this is kinda hard to explain. He was actually fidgeting. Kaori nodded, giving him a go-ahead gesture. Issei finished stacking the shinase, sighed, and took a deep breath. For years, I've been having vague I don't know if they're memories, or dreams, or what. It's been happening for years. Since I was 9 or 10, I think he hesitated, then said, they probably are dreams, I guess. They're so disjointed, and it's like big pieces are missing, there's no way they could be memories. I'd never have forgotten anything like this, because they seem so real somehow, though, he didn't sound fully convinced. What happens in them? Kaori asked. She had the odd feeling that she was getting a better look into Haidu Issei's psyche than anyone else at Kuo, save Sona Kaichu. That thought oddly warmed her. In them in them, I'm younger, and so are my folks. And there's a bunch more people living in the house. Mostly girls. And we're happy. All of us are happy. Issei smiled wistfully, missing her gobsmacked expression. I remember that much, clear as day. That's the Kandoka struggled to find the words. That look on his face that had been such an uncomplicated brilliant smile, despite the complexity of what was prompting it. Those are vivid dreams, ice, she finally managed. How long did you say you've been having them? Since I was 9 or 10, he answered, shaking his head. My parents had a rough year or two around then. They were always arguing. I think they were actually talking divorce. She gave her friend a sympathetic look. That wasn't an easy thing for a kid to deal with. Hmm. Could these dreams be a reaction to that? Like, as a kind of escape from the situation. Not that I could blame you. She hurriedly added. Issei considered that for a moment, finally shrugging. I guess it's possible, he said. You've got a point. I was virtually a Hikikomori during that year, and I spent a lot of time sleeping, he shrugged. So, I guess that's where it comes from. Did you ever tell your parents about it? She asked. Once, he said. When I was 11, I think. Told them about the dreams. Tusan shrugged it off, said dreams about girls were natural. Ka-san just pretended I didn't say anything. I can see how that'd affect you, Kaori told him. She really could, too. She wondered if anyone else at school had any idea. 
She wondered if anyone outside of the student council, and maybe the orc, would care. You had a dream that made you happy, and you clung to it that kind of dream, and the onset of puberty, and his parents deciding to pretend he hadn't even asked anything yeah, she could see how that would go. And ran with it, maybe too far, he said, pausing to stretch. And then you started changing, Kaori observed in a curious voice. Started trying to bring it under control. I take it that Kaichu was the reason. The main one, he agreed, fidgeting again. But not the only one. I'd always been into computers since middle school, and one day, just before we graduated middle school, I read an article about creating AI's artificial intelligences, he explained. I've seen movies with those, she told him, making a go on gesture. He robbed the back of his head. I guess it occurred to me that maybe I could make my own AI harem if I learned enough about programming, and so I didn't need to do stuff like that anymore he shrugged. It wasn't very long after that that Sona-san and I started getting to know each other, though, and it wasn't very long after that that I started falling for her. The bowl was already rolling by then he stretched and yawned, adding, you know, I don't think I've told this to anyone else. Not even Kaichu? Kaori said, surprised. Nope, Issei said, rubbing his shoulder. I haven't really thought it through in a long time. I guess something about you made me feel I could talk about it, Kaori-san. That's kind thanks the lighting in the storage room was dim, a fact that Kaori was grateful for right now. Her cheeks felt warm enough to diakoniku on. And you should probably tell Kaichu that story, too. Don't tell her you told me first, though. She had to push that out in a rush, too. The urge to hold onto a secret about him that only she knew had been strong. Good idea. Thank you for listening, Kaori-san. Issei grinned at her. The Kondoka smiled back weakly. She couldn't help thinking back to the short conversation that Sona Kaichu had had with her the day after she'd become a devil. Admitting her feelings for Issei, at least to herself, was becoming less and less of a problem. Knowing what to do with them, especially when she knew what path would make it possible to act on them, was an entirely different matter. Right now, it was all she could do not to ask him to drop the sand when talking to her. Loud, she said, we'd better hurry. Kaichu and Asia-chan are probably waiting for us. Shizuku-san. Come in, it's been forever. How are you? How are your parents? They're well, thank you, Rio Dono. They send their regards. Shizuku entered the Hayadu residence, towing off her shoes carefully. She had a large bundle slung over her left shoulder. Rio eyed that bundle. Am I to take it that you're on official business? Partly. Well, mostly, she admitted as Rio guided her into the living room. Have a seat, Rio told her. I have some tea ready, if you'd like. I'd appreciate that, Shizuku said gratefully. She and Ryo made small talk over tea and crackers for a short while, before the lady of the house guided the conversation back towards duty. So, Shizuku-san, I assume that your official buciness is what's inside the bundle. Perceptive as always, Ryo Dono. Shizuku unwrapped the bundle, taking great care as she did. Inside the traveling blanket rested its Arugi-style sword, its hilt wrapped in sky-blue silk and its scabbard a lacquered rust red. She set the sword on the coffee table. Rio regarded it for a long moment, in the same fashion that one might regard a long ago lover kissing someone else. Finally, she said, I returned Aim Noah Habari to Yasaka san for a reason, Shizuku san. I didn't believe I could both be a mother and wield it properly. That hasn't changed. Yasaka Dono begs to differ. Shizuku's voice was one of respectful disagreement. I share her opinion. Please, take up the sword again. See for yourself. Rio gave her a searching look, then gripped the sword by the scabbard and stood. As she did, the sword's form warped and changed, growing into a tachi with a white tassel dangling from the pommel. The homemaker regarded the change with narrowed eyes. You see? Aim no Habari recalls the preferred form of the last wielder to demonstrate her worthiness, Shizuku said. It shows that her worthiness has not lapsed. The holy swords of Shinto mythology were not, strictly speaking, exactly the same as those of the West. They were almost all of divine origin themselves, created in Takamagahara by and for the gods, and their heroes or descendants. In fact, they were arguably divine entities themselves, sentient and able to manipulate both their own forms and the elements associated with their original divine wielders. Aim no Habari had been the blade of the progenitor deity Izanagi, who used to it to slay the fire Kami Kagatsuchi, whose burning birth had killed Izanagi's wife. This made it a blade capable of wreathing itself in flame or striking opponents at long range with white-hot plasma. Shinto holy sword wielders with sufficient skill and willpower could persuade their weapons kami to take the form of sword types they were more accustomed to. And the former Daoman Ryo had been the most skilled wielder of Aim Noah Habari in centuries. That, and her other more energetic talents, had contributed to her nickname of Akaji Haim, the Azure Conflagration Princess. I suppose so, Ryo said, her voice heavy with mixed emotions. She looked as though a missing limb had suddenly been returned to its socket, though. 
I assume there's a reason Yasaka Sen is so insistent about this, then. There is a good chance that someone in Grigori has started targeting Sacred Gear users, Shizuku told her. She held up a hand as Ryo's eyes widened. We don't believe that Azizular his confidants are pushing for this, but there is a good chance that someone at or near their level is trying to build a Sacred Gear stockpile for some purpose. Ryo digested that as she sat back down, laying aim Noah Habari across her lap. This tracked entirely too well with the circumstances around Issei's reincarnation and Asia's rescue. Not that she needed to share this with Shizuku just yet. The implication was clear. Issei was a Sacred Gear user, or at least bore one, and that made him a target. So this is for our defense, she said finally. Shizuku nodded. It's not, strictly speaking, a by-the-book application of the strictures for holy sword usage. But what affects the family of the Aikaji Haim would likely have repercussions for Kyoto and Takamagahara, so she shrugged. Ryo nodded. Thank you. Her brows knitted as a thought occurred to her. I'm surprised you're not wielding aim Noah Habari, Shizuku-san. I carry Futsu no Matama, Shizuku explained. My elemental affinity for air and lightning is far higher. She paused, then added, there is additional news that will probably affect you. Ryo's eyes sharpened. Oh. This will take explaining, Shizuku sighed. Tsukiyomi Dono has returned to Takamagahara. The Madarasu Dono has allowed him to. Ryo asked incredulously, raising both eyebrows. There have been conditions, but yes, Shizuku said, her own expression matching Ryo's. He accepted them readily enough. It seems he's eager to actually reconcile with her. I see, Ryo replied. Her tone said I'll believe that when I see it. It wasn't, precisely speaking, a rare opinion among those with ties to Kyoto or the Kami. You'll forgive me, Shizuku-san, if I'm not seeing what this has to do with me. One of the conditions was that he relinquishes Origiri, Shizuku stated. Kyoto has taken possession of it, but Yusaka Dono is seeking a more permanent solution. Like, for example, a suitable wielder. Ryo stared at her in shocked silence. The term cursed holy sword might be an oxymoron, but if it could be said to apply to anything, it would have to be his origiri. That wasn't even the sword's original name, but no one remembered it or admitted to remembering it. Not even Tsukuyomi. It was the sword that he'd killed the fertility goddess Yukmachi with, the act that had gotten him banished from Amaterasu's sight. And, not coincidentally, formed the basis of the myth about the sun and moon never meeting. As a divine sword that had slain a goddess, it was undeniably powerful, but it was considered a spiritual hot potato for the same reason. The suitable wielder? For that. Ryo said. She was looking less thunderstruck now, but her tone was still incredulous. You'll understand. No one in Kyoto is willing to touch it. But, if we could find a suitable wielder here, use it as a pretext to strengthen cordial ties. You're thinking of offering it to the devils? Ryo asked. She hated to admit it, but that wasn't the craziest idea she'd ever heard. Offering a holy sword, even a cursed one, as a gift of friendship was a gesture that all but demanded reciprocation. It would definitely get Yuzorajiri away from Takamagahara and potentially keep a recidivist Tsukiyomi from claiming its power. And, if Kyoto could make sure it went to a relatively ethical, or, at least, pragmatic, wielder, there was a good chance that they could guarantee that the sword was pointed at the right enemies, or, at least, away from Kyoto. That line of thought is on the table, yes, Shizuku said. I already have two promising candidates at the academy. One of them is in your daughter-in-law's peerage. Ryo had to smile, albeit ruefully. Naturally. I suppose you're telling me that Issei is going to be a crux for events, then? There is a good chance of that, yes, Shizuku said apologetically. Joining Sona Sen's peerage may be the best thing for him in the long run, but I'm certain there are things that you and Goru Dono could teach him. Should, even she blushed. My apologies. I overstepped. It's nothing we haven't considered, Ryo sighed. We were hoping to put it off until he had graduated, but with events moving the way they seem to be yes. We'll speak with him tonight. He'll probably have Sona Sen with him, and maybe she can help soften the blow about Goru Kun and I. They're actually pretty well matched. I think she will, Shizuku agreed. You should know that he's joined the Kendo Club now. Perhaps Aim Noah Habari will pass to him, eventually. I somehow doubt that, Ryo said wistfully. But I hope he learns some things from you. Both of them looked up as they heard the front door open. Ryo let out another sigh. I suppose that conversation will be taking place now, then. I have faith in you, Ryo Dono. Shizuku gave her a reassuring smile. And him, too, if it comes to that. She rolled the blanket back up into the bundle and stood, shouldering it once more. As Issei, Sona, Asia, and a brunette Ryo had never seen before came into view, the kendo club captain offered them a bow. Murayama. Haidu kun. Shitori san. But you? Issei and Murayama asked in unison, clearly surprised. Sona looked somewhat less surprised, but even her expression wasn't completely free of it. Asia was just completely lost. 
I was just calling upon your mother, Haidu-kun, Shizuku said briskly. Your parents, and mine and Kyoto, are old friends. My parents' old friends are starting to come up a lot lately, Issei said curiously. I suppose it might seem that way, Shizuku replied, her tone equable. Ryo Dono, have a good evening. She offered a bow to her club members and Sona, who returned them automatically, and took her leave. Ryo felt a momentary spike of combined irritation and admiration. Shizuku's mother, Sayaka, had a similar talent for making narrow escapes and leaving other people to explain. Ah san, this is Mireyama Kaori san, Issei said, his tone slightly quizzical. She's a friend from the kendo club, and why is there a tachi on the coffee table? He started to enter the living room and then stopped, his expression suddenly pinched as if he were experiencing a severe headache. What the hell? Step back, Issei kun, Sona said softly. Ryo san, is that a holy sword? Yes. Yes it is, Sona-san, Ryo replied, with more formality than she'd used in speaking to her future daughter-in-law thus far. Give me a moment, and I'll put it up. Thank you, that'd be appreciated. Sona's voice sounded slightly more relaxed now. Ryo picked up a sword, heading towards the back stairs and the master bedroom. As she went, she mentally turned on the passive eavesdropping spell she'd long since laid into the living room walls. She thought about casting one on Issei's room a long time ago, but since he'd hit puberty, she'd decided against it for her own sanity. Sona Chan, what's going on? Issei asked, his tone starting to sound not panicked, but wary. Your mother and I will explain as soon as she puts the sword away, Sona told him, trying to reassure him. Is this a secret? I thought I asked you to Rio knew that tone, that sound of ramping up in her son's voice. She also heard it cut off and wondered what Sona had done to make it stop. Maybe it was physical touch since they'd revealed their engagement, she'd noticed that little touches between the two of them had become common. The realization that she and Goro might have contributed to Issei being touch-starved occurred to Ryo, bringing guilt with it. I didn't know anything for sure until just now, Sona said, her tone remorseful. All the stories said the Citrieris was cool and calculating, and Ryo had seen that for herself. But she also knew that Sona adored her son. It was more than a little uncomfortable, seeing those two things clash like this. Just rumors and suspicion. You're right, though. I'm sorry. I, it's fine. I just really don't want this to be a habit, okay? Issei's tone was calmer, more reasoned, now. Ryo silently wondered what the other girls were thinking of this. By now, she had reached the master bedroom, and she set aim no ohabari on the dresser, on the empty sword rack she'd never been able to bring herself to get rid of. It was kind of sad how happy she was to have the holy sword back in her possession. I promise. It won't be. Sona's voice sounded absolutely sincere. Ryo hoped that she would be able to stick to that. Ice, do you want me and Asia Chan to put the takeout in the kitchen? that was the new girl, Murayama. She seemed to be trying to move the subject toward something more comfortable. Also, the way she was referring to Issei it sounded like his father's heritage might be coming into play. Yeah, go ahead, please, Issei said. Ryo decided now was a good time to put in an appearance. She let the eavesdropping spell go dormant again and walked calmly down the stairs. Issei and Sona sat, side by side, on one of the couches in the living room, holding each other's hands in a death grip. Both of them seemed to be in somewhat better spirits. Ryo sat across from them. For the record, she said calmly, I approve of the heiress to the house of Citri being my daughter-in-law. You clearly care a great deal for my son. I do, Sona said firmly. And that's why I'd like to discuss some things about him. I'm really tired of being kept in the dark, Issei said softly, his voice not quite free from a note of plaintiveness. Both women in the room flinched, looking at him contritely. I won't anymore, Issei, Ryo promised, her expression still stricken. Ask what you need to ask. It'll be easier to show you. Issei gave Sona's hand a last squeeze and rose. By now, the Rekadan gestures had become second nature. He watched his mother's face as the blue-white flames came to life, wreathing his hands. It was the look of a woman seeing something she knew like the back of her hand. Yes, she said finally. You get that from me. It's the signature magic of our branch of the Dauman family. Dauman? Sona's head snapped up in surprise. As in, of the five great families. She glanced at Issei. Anada, could you please? Huh? Oh, right. Issei made a shaking free motion with his hands, bidding the flames disappear. So you're a pyrokinetic too, Kasan. He gave Sona a sideways look. Five great families. Yes, although my parents never liked that term, Ryo replied. And the five families are old noble clans associated with the Shinto faction, and through them, the Kyoto faction. They're a complicated thing. I haven't exactly been on speaking terms with the R family's main line in years, anyway she sighed. I have a lot of things to tell you, Issei. Both your father and I. Well I mean, as long as you're being upfront now, Issei said, attempting a reassuring tone. 
Yes, Ryo said with a nod. Let's go out back, so I can show you my pyrokinesis. Sona rose to her feet. I'd be very curious to see, as well. Inner's ready to what's going on. Asia asked as she saw Ryo, Issei, and Sona headed into the backyard. Ha-sen is gonna show us her pyrokinesis, Issei said offhandedly. He then ground to a halt, realizing that Asia might not have any idea what he was talking about. Between the mentions of holy swords and everyone suddenly acting weird. Oh, interesting, she said brightly. I'd like to see it too. Me too, Kaori said. Well, come on, then, Ryo urged the teenagers. As they stepped outside, she waved a hand, a magical circle briefly flaring to life before her, the light pitter pad of rain died away, blocked off by an invisible field. Once they'd followed her into the backyard, she commented, the way you manifest your flames is very clever, Issei. All those video games when you were supposed to be at middle school, I presume? She sounded more amused than anything else. Seems that way, Issei answered, rubbing the back of his head. You're not the first one to make that observation. Mine is a little more dramatic, Ryo admitted. Give me some room, please. Ten meters should do. Once the teenagers had backed up that far, she took a deep breath. That same blue-white fire was suddenly surrounding her like an aura. Hasan. Issei blurted out, starting to lurch forward to pull her from the flames. Sona and Kaori dragged him back, and as they did he blinked, fully processing her state within them. That's amazing how are you controlling them? I will power. You do the same, don't you? Sort of it's like, in my mind, my hands are the weapons, and the pyrokinesis the ammunition I load into it. Launching it is just like you know, being a kid, playing like it's a toy gun. Bang. Issei made a finger gun again, this time keeping his fire unmanifested, and mimed a firing motion. Ryo stared at him for a long moment, then smiled broadly. That's very similar to how I do this. A long lick of blue flame reared up before her, and she closed her right hand around it. As she did so, the flames reshaped themselves into a tachi comprised entirely of fire. Wow, Issei whispered, eyes wide. Asia and Kaori could only nod in agreement, their own expressions awestruck. Akaji, indeed, Sona said in amazement. That's remarkable pyrokinetic control, Ryo-san. Imagine what Issei-kun will be capable of in the future. I suppose that's your way of asking if I'll help train him, Ryo said in a good-naturedly teasing tone. The answer is yes, although it seems he's off to a good start already. Wait, Sona-chan you said that last week, didn't you? Issei said curiously. Azure conflagration. I suppose that's come back to haunt me. Ryo smiled ruefully. When I was actively working for the Kyoto faction, I had earned the nickname Akaji Haim because of my pyrokinesis. The Haim had more to do with being part of the Daoman family. Sona Chan's told me a little about the Kyoto faction, Issei admitted. I know zilch about your family, though, Kasan. Let's go in and eat, Ryo suggested. I'll tell you a little about them. So what is Tusan? Issei asked curiously. They'd made short work of the sushi platters that Sona had bought, although a large portion had been set aside for his father's dinner. I'd really prefer to wait until your father gets home, before we get into that, Ryo answered. Mine isn't the only side of the family you've inherited gifts from. And, just as he's not well equipped to address my pyrokinesis, I'm not well equipped to discuss his abilities. Issei-san doesn't know? Asia asked curiously. He turned towards her, his mouth falling open. You know. Well, your parents rescued me, from Asia trailed off as she saw the look on Ryo's face. It wasn't exactly a facipum, but it sure carried the same connotations. Who did you rescue Asia Chan from? Sona asked carefully, reaching for Issei's hand again. Rogue Grigori agents, Ryo said softly. Led by the one who tried to kill Issei. Brainer. Issei looked shocked. Wait, how did you know about? Shizuku-san is also the Kyoto faction observer in Kyoto, Sona explained. I'm guessing that's how your parents found out. Is there anything but you doesn't have a hand in around here? Kaori wondered aloud. The Yagashi family has a talent for staying tapped into everything, Ryo told the Kondoka. It's part of what makes them so useful for Kyoto. For a moment, it looked to Issei like his mother was sizing Kaori up, but he couldn't imagine what for. And what happened to her? Rainer. Issei leaned back in his chair, still looking gobsmacked. Grigori has her imprisoned. They think she's working with a rogue of fallen angels, so she's being questioned. Ryo gave her son a reassuring look. She won't be bothering you again, Issei. A friend of ours in Grigori will see to that. Issei let out a shuddering breath, still clinging to Sona's hand. Dot that wasn't something he'd even thought about, the possibility of Raynor coming back to make another try for his sacred gear. The fact that she wasn't a threat anymore was reassuring. That still left the question dangling, though. Kasan, what is Tusan? If you're a fire mage, what is he? Asia and Ryo exchange looks again. The latter sighed, giving the former nun a go-ahead gesture. She cleared her throat and said, um, Issei-san, your father is a dragon. 
Say what now? Issei repeated in shock, goggling at Asia. Sona and Kaori were reacting in a similar fashion. It's true. Ryo glanced to one side. He's a Japanese dragon. The Kyoto faction has a nickname for him, like it does for me. Kurepu. The black gale is same used. That's honestly, that's cool. So is Akaji Haim. I wish you guys had told me these things. There were some painful things that happened around the time we went into retirement, Ryo said, something dark and haunted flashing through her eyes. For a moment, Issei felt a pang of something himself, like there was something he should be asking, but his mother had resumed speaking. We wanted to put as much of it behind us as we could. But we should have guessed that, this being Kuo, the supernatural would find its way to you. Well things turned out okay, so I can't complain, Issei said, giving Sona a quick smile. She relaxed beside him, squeezing his hand. They glanced up as they heard the front door open and shut, and Goru call out, Ryo, I'm home. Do we have guests? Ryo rose, going to the dining room's doorway. Welcome home, Goru-kun. Yes, Sona-chan brought dinner for all of us, and one of Issei's friends from Kendo Club came as well. Sounds great, Goru said, loosening his tie as he entered the room. He stopped at the incredulous look he was getting from Issei. Something wrong, son. When were you gonna tell me I was half-dragon? Issei blurted out, his tone matching his expression. And for that matter, why does a dragon work in an office? That's a long story, Goru answered, frozen in the doorway. His own expression was one of utter stupefaction. Ryo. Chizuku-san returned aim no ohabari to me today, and Issei came home while she was still here, Ryo explained as she returned to her chair. He knows, Goru-kun. Ah. His shock subsiding, Goru sat next to his wife and sighed. All right, Issei. You're right, we should have told you earlier. Particularly when you and Sonachan started getting close. Issei's expression started shifting from incredulity to awkwardness. Well like I told Kasan, as long as you're being upfront about stuff now, it's fine. Um, after dinner, I have questions about being a half-dragon. No buzzing control towers, Ryo said immediately, her tone stern. You do that. Wait can I do that? No buzzing control towers, Ryo repeated, this time more forcefully. Yes, Kasan, Issei muttered. It's only difficult the first time, Goru explained. It's a matter of understanding that you're more than just the form you currently wear. We spend most of our time in human bodies because, in most ways, they're far more convenient. But that doesn't mean it's your natural form. He and Issei stood in the middle of the backyard, while Ryo, Sona, Asia and Kaori stood near the back door. Ryo had again raised a force field against the drizzle, and she and Goru had insisted that Issei have as wide a berth as possible for his first transformation. Are there others like us in Japan? Issei asked curiously. Dragons aren't exactly common in the world anymore, Goru answered. Even in earlier times, our numbers weren't overwhelming. But, yes, and most of them are aligned with the Kyoto faction as well. Goru drummed his fingers idly on his pants leg. The Haidu family is descended directly from Ryujin, as are a handful of others. Most of the rest are descended from relatively minor dragon kami. Wait, what? Issei's jaw dropped. We're descended from Ryujin. Does that make us? He looked at Sona. The term is demigod, right? As far as I understand it, Sona said, and if her tone was still bipedical, her expression was not. Technically, I suppose, although there's been a lot of intervening generations. Goro rubbed the back of his head sheepishly. Don't go crossing the Ama no Yukihashi or knocking at Ryujin's palace gates unless you want polite confusion at best. Not until you've made a name for yourself, at least. Wow okay Issei turned towards Ryo. You know all this too, right, Kasan? Ryo nodded. It's a lot to unpack, I know. Don't dwell too much on it right now. Your mother's right. We've drifted off topic. Goru cleared his throat. Concentrate. Close your eyes if it helps, but concentrate and reach inside yourself. He held up a hand, looking slightly exasperated, before Issei could say anything. I know how it sounds. But it'll make sense. Okay. Issei closed his eyes and tried reaching inside himself. At first, it really did sound silly. But after a moment it was hard for him to really describe, later on. The closest he could come up with was that it was like finding a program icon on his desktop that he'd never noticed before, and that clicking on it felt like the most natural thing in the world. From an external perspective, his parents and friends stared in wonderment as Haidu Issei suddenly exploded in size, midnight blue scales replacing human flesh. Moments later, a Japanese dragon crouched in the backyard, looking around as if it were seeing the world really seeing it for the first time. Is this for real? Issei's voice came from the dragon's mouth, excited and loud. Yes, it is. Goru's voice was full of pride. Good job, son. Now, try lowering your voice. The wards around the fence are good, but they're not that good. Sona slowly approached Issei, moving as if in a dream. 
Finally reaching him, she rested a hand on his snout. He nudged her hand with his snout, like a cat forcing someone to pet it, and he watched in delight as her lips curled upward in a wide, uncomplicated smile. You really are my Asei Kun, aren't you? She said softly. Of course I am, he replied. It was remarkable how strong his senses were right now. Sona smelled like flowers no, like an entire garden, in the aftermath of a springtime drizzle. Sona-chan, this is I can't begin to describe it. I think amazing works well enough, Sona replied, petting his head. Now, let's teach you to fly, Goru suggested. Flying Issei looked up, and it was clear from his body language, even as a dragon, that the idea had his interest. Flying. Goru blinked, and suddenly there were two Japanese dragons crowded under Ryo's magical anti-rain shield. The best way to learn is by doing. How about your girls hop on your back, and your mom and Asia-chan get on mine, and we have a little race. Race. Issei perked up. With some reluctance, he started to add, and it's not like that with Kaori-san. First one to Yokohama wins, Goru said, clearly ignoring Issei's last sentence. Loser buys everyone a late night snack. Which way is Yokohama? Issei asked dubiously. I let your girls navigate for you, Goru said in a magnanimous tone. He smirked at his son. Think you can keep up with me, boy. Issei stared back, fully aware he was being baited. Not that he really cared right now you just try and stop me, old man. He retorted and then turned his gaze toward Sona and Kaori. You two okay with this? Sona nodded. I'll be fine either way. You just beat your father. She swung herself easily onto Issei's back and fished out her phone, opening a navigation app. Kaori was pale, but gave him a determined look. We'll hang in there. I wouldn't be able to live with myself if I fell off a dragon's back the first time I rode one. She climbed up behind Sona, shifting around until she was comfortable. Come on, Goru-kun. Let's show Issei how it's done. Ryo paused thoughtfully, then said, actually, that is the point of this entire exercise, isn't it? She hopped onto Goru's back with the ease of long experience and looked at Asia, reaching down a hand. Just hold on to me tightly, Asia-chan. Asia nodded, letting Ryo pull her upwards. Goru waited until Ryo and Asia were seated comfortably, then turned towards Issei. When you want to take off for the first time, think of it as if you're jumping and then starting to run. Point yourself upwards. He smiled a draconic smile. Try to break through the cloud line. The sight of the sky for the first time, from above the clouds there's nothing like it. And with that, he oriented himself so that he was facing the sky and shot upwards like an arrow, piercing through the cloud cover. Okay. Hold on, you too, Issei said, as he carefully emulated his father's positioning. He tensed and then jumped and ran, like Goru had said, and the ground rapidly fell away from beneath him and the clouds got bigger and bigger. He shot into them, barely hearing the noises of surprise and dismay from Sona and Kaori, but before he could react to them he was coming out the other side. His father had been right. There really wasn't anything like this. Oh, Mayu, Sona breathed. Issei-kun, it's beautiful. Ice Kaori trailed off, awestruck, and gulped. I never thought I'd see anything like this. Around them, the sky was a deep dark blue, dotted with a myriad of white silver pinpricks of light. A gleaming white half-moon hung serenely among them, as if it were a benevolent monarch holding court. Beneath them were the clouds, fluffy and perfectly matching the color of the moonlight. Not far away, as aeronautical distances went, Goru was also adrift in the sky. The elder dragon looked pleased as punch. Well. What did I tell you? He said with a good-natured smirk. You weren't kidding. Issei enthused. I feel almost like we're flying in space. It is a little like that, Goru agreed. Ready to race. Sona fiddled with her phone and said aloud, ready to navigate for you, Issei-kun. Thanks, Sona-chan. Issei looked at his father. Ready when you are. See you in Yokohama, then. Goro rocketed off, and Issei scrambled after him. When asked to describe it later, Issei would say that was flying was like riding a bike. It wasn't exactly like that, but it was the closest Bipaji he could come up with. It was a matter of finding the most desirable wind currents and riding them, pushing upwards with effort to rise in altitude and doing the inverse to go lower, and he did that by pedaling and steering was the best Bipaji he could come up with. He instinctively grasped the basics of it, but keeping up with his father was proving to be more of a challenge than he'd expected. Especially when Goru kept pulling off these ridiculous maneuvers damn show off. And trying to make sure Sona and Kaori remained safe and snug also proved a challenge. Not to mention that Sona leaning close to his ear to call out directions, constantly bordered on distracting. He gritted his teeth and plowed on, resisting the urge to go nape of the earth and spook drivers. He sensed a better current and leaned into it, gaining altitude and tightening down was the best way he could describe it at the time. Later, he'd compare it to a classic VF1 Valkyrie, pulling its wings in tighter to speed up. 
In any event, he shot ahead of his father, the air around him whipping past even faster. He let out a whoop of delight, resisting the urge to attempt a barrel roll. Yes, he heard Sona murmur in satisfaction, stroking his head. Kaori let out a whoop of her own, pumping a fist into the air. He'll be pissed if he finds out you let him have this one, Ryo observed conversationally. She was actually sitting cross-legged on her husband's back, something that Asia marveled at. Who says I did? Goru said lazily. He's high on adrenaline and showing off for his girls. I didn't have to slow down or anything. True to his words, he was flying at a pretty brisk clip, though not as brisk as Issei's comet impression. But Kaori-san's not his girl, Asia said curiously. He's engaged to Sona-san, right? True. But I have a feeling about Kaori-chan. After all, it's common for both devils and dragons to have multiple spouses, Ryo explained. Asia opened her mouth to speak, then snapped it shut. She suspected she knew the answer. It was too late to avert awkwardness, though, Ryo was already wincing. She couldn't see Goru's expression or even read a dragon's face, but she could feel a tension in him that hadn't been there a moment before. The former nun cringed. I'm sorry, she whispered. No no, you didn't do anything wrong, Ryo said quickly. There are reasons it's been just Goru-kun and I for a long time. Before Asia could ask, Ryo said even more quickly, yes. What you're probably thinking of that's a large part of it. I'd prefer not to discuss it further right now. Of course. Asia spoke quickly herself, in a hurry to dispel the sudden gloom. The damage was done, though, and the gloom didn't start lifting until their flight took them near Yokohama. What else do I need to know? Issei asked eagerly. The six of them were standing outside in Izakaya and Yokohama, nibbling on Yakitori. The night sky was clear, a welcome change from the low-level deluge Kuo had been stewing in. The teenagers were drinking Ramyun, while Goru and Ryo were drinking beer. Ryo was watching her husband like a hawk to make sure his intake stayed minimal. Next, let's cover your senses, Goru told him. Even in your human form, you'll find them enhanced. Especially scent. Scent will be very important to you. The people who are important to you family, friends, mates will have very distinctive smells to them. The closer they are to you, the more detailed their scent. It'll often be overlaid with impressions of flavors. Places too, or times of year, or even abstract concepts. Abstract concepts is say repeated dubiously. Through scent. Not like math or philosophy, Goru said exasperatedly. More emotional. Love, home, family, things like that. I'm sure the way Sona-chan smells to you will be very complex, very laden with that kind of meaning. Goru-kun, Ryo said, gently swatting her husband's arm. Be a little more delicate, please. What does Ka-san smell like to you, then? Issei asked pointedly. Yakiniku, Goru answered bluntly. Ryo turned bright red. Honestly talk about things you never get to live down. I don't want him to elaborate on that, do I? Issei asked dryly. No, you do not. Ryo's tone broke no argument. Sona's face was slightly pink now. That didn't stop her from asking curiously, Issei-kun. What is my scent like to you? Issei closed his eyes, remembering earlier. A garden just after a spring rain. Cool and clean, all the flowers in bloom, soothing he opened his eyes, smiling sheepishly. Home. Sona's face just got pinker. A tremulous smile on her face, she said softly, that may be the most poetic thing anyone's ever told me. Hayori fidgeted in place, finally mustering up the courage to ask. Ice. What do I smell like to you? Issei blinked, his own face suddenly reddening. Um. Hum. Let me he inhaled quickly, thinking, and his brows knit in bemusement. Cinnamon and sugar. And baked dough. A cookie, I think what are those cookies made with cinnamon and sugar called? Snickerdoodles, Sona said, her tone intrigued, and gave Kaori an appraising look. My mother's shown me how to make those, Kaori said softly, trying and failing not to blush. That's what your scent is like to me, Issei said, looking anywhere but at her. Those kind of cookies, cooling on the windowsill on a summer's day, their scent filling the house. He stopped abruptly, as if afraid of thinking aloud further. Like I said, scents are really detailed with the girls you El Goru winced as Ryo drove her elbow into his gut. Oh, fine, fine. Issei, what do your mother and I smell like to you? Ah scent smells like fire, Issei said quickly. He was clearly glad for the subject change. A campfire in the forest, with pine trees around. Another quick inhalation. You smell like salt water and ozone. Interesting, Ryo said, sounding pleased. My branch of the Dauman family actually lived in a forest estate that description is oddly nostalgic for me. Salt water, huh? Goru said, beeping his head. I do like skimming the shoreline while flying. Your mother will back me up on this. I will not back him up on justifying it, though, Ryo said archly. Your father's been known to try and buzz air control towers. Give some poor folks heart attacks. No buzzing control towers, Issei-kun, Sona said immediately. 
Ryo had opened her mouth to say it, but gave Sona an approving look instead. What about highways? He asked dryly. Only after midnight. There was a hint of dry humor in her tone now. Issei had a feeling that if he did try flying no late at night, Sona would be along for the ride. What do I smell like? Asia asked curiously. Breakfast cereal, Issei and Goru answered simultaneously, then eyed each other suspiciously. That was enough for the others to burst into laughter. So I hope this isn't a deal breaker, me being a dragon and all, Issei joked. It was well after midnight. Kaori had been dropped off on the way back to his house, and he and Sona were now getting ready for bed. Of course not. Sona smirked affectionately at him. You're not the first dragon to have been reincarnated as a devil, but they're still very uncommon. Remember what I said about you being special because you're you? Yeah, I do, he said, his tone now slightly bashful. Not that this really changes anything, she assured him. You'd be just as special to me if you were just a programmer. I feel the same, Issei told her, wrapping his arms around her. Although if you were just the student council president doesn't sound as dramatic. It's the thought that counts. Sona gave him a slow smile. The heat from it would have surprised anyone at Kuo Academy, even now. Even Ria's or her peerage mates would have been surprised by the combination of naked desire, sardonic humor, and cavity-inducing affection in that grin. It was a wonder that it wasn't paralyzing Issei, and he honestly wasn't escaping it unscathed. No, part of him was actually, well, standing at attention and saluting her so I'm a dragon's senior wife. Yes. You are, he told her, leaning in for a kiss. Sona's lips met his hungrily. The kiss lasted a long time, and their hands did not exactly remain idle. As they broke for air, she shoved him gently back onto his bed. You know, there are stories about dragons she said in a matter-of-fact tone, which provided a not unpleasant contrast with the way she was pulling off his t-shirt. I think I've heard a few, he murmured back, his fingers unbuttoning the school shirt of his that she wore as a nightshirt. Why don't we see if they're true? Why don't we? She agreed, and closed the gap between their mouths again. I bet they think they're being quiet, too, Gore remarked. The noises coming from Issei's room weren't the loudest rows of passion he'd ever overheard, but they certainly were enthusiastic. Probably, Ryo said with an exaggeratedly dramatic sigh. She waved a hand, a magical circle appearing before it briefly. When the circle faded away, the noises were muted. That's much better, Goru said, pecking his wife on the cheek. He followed that with another peck and then a kiss to her mouth. His hand started to move towards the hem of her nightgown. She returned the last kiss and smirked at him. You dragons really do just have one thing on your minds, don't you? Despite her words, her tone demonstrated a marked lack of distaste for the idea, and she made no move to deflect his hand. Ilti is charged, he grinned, his fingers finally sliding up under the nightgown's hem, causing her breath to momentarily hitch. Well okay. She looped her arms around his neck and drew him back in for another kiss. In the end, Asia was the only one in the Hyadu household to get a full night's sleep. Thursday. It wasn't the improved visioner hearing that through a say for a loop. Being able to clearly see faces at 100 plus meters was more blessing than anything else, and as for hearing well, it wasn't like he didn't already have a semi-cynical opinion about many of his schoolmates. No, it was the enhanced sense of smell. Having superhuman olfactory sensitivity made for some interesting realizations about interpersonal dynamics. Issei was finding it instructive. The vast majority of people smelled like unscented soap, with no real distinguishing notes. It was the people he knew personally, though, that things got interesting. That Suda and Motohama both had the acrid, artificially sweet scent of an energy drink, and that was about it. It was a little sad, Issei thought, that their friendship boiled down to artificial flavoring. Amanagawa Senpai was too strong black coffee, while Yugashi Butchu had a vague scent of autumn leaves. At as well, he steered as clear of her as he could, but there was a faint note of azaleas about her. Most of the council had distinctive scents, but not overwhelming ones. Saji had the scent of a strong, sharp curry. Haruko was an odd but not unpleasant blend of gasoline and black licorice, he had no idea where the former had come from. Momo was a caramel matcha. Tamo was French bread, piping hot from the oven. And Tsubaki Fukakechu was green tea. He wasn't looking forward to the next time he spent time with the orc. He had a feeling that Grimory Senpai would smell like something coyingly sweet, while Himejima Senpai would smell like something poisonous. It was the ones that he spent the most time with, the ones who seemed fated to replace Mitsuda and Motohama as his best friends, who were the most vivid. Aika smelled like freshly made peppermint ice cream, with just enough hint of cold milk to suggest a milkshake. The aroma of baked apples, laced with cinnamon, surrounded Ria like an aura. Tsubasa was a bowl of just picked strawberries in the summer heat, sweet and tangy in his nostrils. And then there was Kaori. Issei was trying to figure out when the four of them had become his friends. Well, okay, maybe not Tsubasa or Ria. He'd already known them for months, gotten along with them for that long. 
they, at least, made sense. But Kaori and Aika. And it had come so quickly, being able to think of them so easily by their first names. It had happened virtually in the blink of an eye, but they were already at least as close to him as Mitsuda and Motohama. More than, possibly, hadn't they been defending him in class, when those two idiots had just sat grinning on the sidelines. In some ways, it was almost as if they'd been waiting on him, waiting for him to try to be a decent person. So they were his friends, then. Just friends, but ones he could actually count on for once. That was all, and that was enough. Right? Issei hoped it was just a coincidence that each of them was now linked in his mind with something he considered delicious. Given what Toussaint had said, the more strongly he felt about someone, the more vivid and complex their scent was. So, if Tsubasa, Ria, and Aika were more vivid than the others, and Kaori more vivid than them, than anyone besides Sona. So far, Kaori was the only one whose scent came close to Sona's, in terms of complexity and layers of meaning. Funnily enough, his fiancé was the only one whose scent didn't carry associations of flavor and hunger. But at the same time, she was the scent he wanted to immerse himself in. Hers was a scent he could lay down and die amidst in contentment. And wasn't that a reassuring sentiment, he thought wryly. He hadn't ever really thought that what Sona had told him would be relevant. Or, rather, maybe he'd been reluctant to believe it because it was too much a good thing. But, if he was already looking at. He shook his head hard. Unnoticed by him, Kaori, Ria, and Aika were eyeing him concernedly. Caddis glanced over as well, but was more perplexed than anything else. Whatever he might be thinking, or he couldn't admit the word feeling to himself, not yet he shouldn't assume they'd reciprocate. At least not right away, anyway. No, he needed to take his time unpacking this, and he really wasn't feel up to it right now. This entire thing was hurting his head. He needed to get out of the classroom, bury his head in code. Code made sense. He wouldn't trade the last 14 days for anything, but things had been so much easier when his life had revolved around code. Or maybe flying. Now that it was an option that memory of breaking through the clouds and seeing an unsullied night sky still rang in his memory. You feeling okay, Ikun? He heard Aika ask softly. You're looking kinda flushed. I think I'll live, but thanks, he murmured back. Just dealing with new sensory stuff. It's a little overwhelming. Kaori mentioned something about dragons and scent associations, Aika said musingly, then smirked good-naturedly. She turned bright red when I asked what she smelled like to you. Dust cookies, he muttered. That's all. No need to make his favorite Kendoka blush. A moment later, he himself blushed, realizing what he thought. Uh-huh, Aika said dryly, watching him with a raised eyebrow. I think you need to go lay down. Issei folded his arms on the desk. Just wake me if class starts being relevant. Will do. Aika leaned back at her desk, half listening to the lecture. After a moment, she said softly, Hey, Kun. Issei shifted his eyes back over towards her. Hmm. Maybe take the rest of us flying sometime. Kaori said the view was awesome. Aika smiled genuinely, and for a moment, the scent of peppermint ice cream seemed to grow stronger. Sure, Issei said, pleasantly surprised. He lapsed back into silence, this time thoughtful rather than brooding, and again he didn't notice his peerage mates glancing his way from time to time. It didn't occur to him until much later to wonder just who he was. Hook you long enough, Fox, Selzin sneered at the lilac-haired man. A week spent hiding in a cracker box apartment on Kuo's less respectable side had done nothing for the rogue exorcist's attitude. The constant drizzle that had plagued the city since his arrival hadn't helped, either. Punk off, the fallen angel shot back in reply. He brought with him a hard-sided rolling suitcase and had an unusually long gym bag slung over one shoulder. You don't know what things are like at Grigori right now. Azazel and his toadies know something is up and they're cracking down. Hmm. The former exorcist considered that and nodded brusquely. I guess I can see that. But that doesn't change what I need. He nodded at the suitcase the other man had brought in. Is that all of it? Most of it, Fox said. He hefted the suitcase onto the cheap folding table and unlatched it, swinging it open. Nested into foam inserts were 20 filled magazines for a high-caliber pistol. Such as, by sheer coincidence, the one holstered inside Selzin's robes. 20 full clips of holy rounds, the fallen angel announced. Underneath them is the holy water you wanted. Only two vials, though. Selzin looked irritated. Ammo's good, but I wanted 40 clips. And only two vials. This is all Kakabiel was able to cover for the absence of, the lilac-haired man said pedantically. You know our sources of both holy ammunition and holy water are carefully monitored. Yeah, I guess. Selzin sounded like a kid who knew he was tired, but refused to admit it. All right, I guess I'll make do. There is a bonus, though, Fox added, unslinging the gym bag and setting it on the table. Galilee sent this for you. He seemed to think you could put it to good use. Selzin's expression lost its petulance, and he unzipped the bag. He grinned madly at what he saw inside. 
is this what I think it is? He claims it is, anyway, Fox said, then added, I need to head back. Sure, Selzen said absently, staring almost worshipfully at the bag's contents. Selzen. A word of advice. As the rogue exorcist looked at him, Fox shrugged. I know you want the girl, but Azazel's made it clear she's not to be touched. Cross that line, and there'll be limits to how much Kakabiel can help you afterwards. Selzen shrugged. I'll take that chance. It's not like the shitty devils in this town can beat me in a fight. They have sacred gears, Fox pointed out. And there are rumors about under the table help from Kyoto. Don't get beepy. That was Raynor's mistake. Selzen snorted. Raynor is a walking mistake. And it's only because she and Donaseek are keeping their traps shut that no one's watching for you here. Fox shook his head. Consider this a word to the wise. Fine, I'll take it under advisement. Selzen nodded at the fallen angel. You can go now. Fox snorted and left. Selzen waited until the door had shut before reaching into the bag and pulling out the sword it contained. It resembled a long kris, with a diamond-shaped gap in the blade one-third of the way along its length and spikes along both edges. He could admit that the fallen angel had a point. But he also knew his strengths. And with the holy sword of heavenly flare, there was no one in Kuo who could stand against him. Friday. The giant. The voice came from behind to say. He turned and smiled at his future sister-in-law. Sarani. What are you doing here? He looked inquisitively at her. She was in magical girl cosplay again, but it wasn't from a series he recognized. I came to see you and so tan, of course, Sir Afal answered, striking a pose. Also, I'm here to meet with the Kyoto faction observer. But mostly to see you too. She fell out of the pose and grabbed Issei's arm. Wait, you're meeting with Butchu? Issei raised both his eyebrows as they walked. Is everything all right? At the moment, yes, Sir Afal told him. It has to do with a surprise for so tan's new night. I actually got in last night to help arrange it. I guess that's why Sona-chan got in so late and passed right out. Issei beeped his head. Well, with that smile, it doesn't sound like anything bad. Nope, not at all. Trust me, at this rate, Sotan will have the best equipped peerage of her generation. Seraphil abruptly grinned at her future brother-in-law as they walked. So I've heard things about your family. I figured Sona-chan had told you, Issei mused. She also told me what you think she smells like, Seraphil added dryly. Yeah, well he blushed. I wonder what kind of scent I give off. The man wondered. I hope it's something cute. Issei inhaled quickly, beeping his head, and chuckled softly. Would you believe Machi ice cream? What kind? She said thoughtfully. Pona coffee. She smirked good-naturedly at him. I guess I can live with that. By the way, I don't think I know the show that costume's from, he said curiously. Oh, I guess so Tan didn't mention it. Seraphil's grin could be seen from orbit. It's from my show. I have a magical girl show of my own in the underworld. Issei paused and stared at her in amazement. You do? Seraphil nodded enthusiastically. It's called Miracle Levia Tan. Her grin turned into a smirk as Issei parsed a pun and winced. It's based on some of my adventures when I was younger. Wow, Issei said. Truth be told, he was more grappling with the fact that she was probably much, much older than him. Even though she looked younger than Sona. Beside that, the fact that she had her own TV show was virtually mundane. And, you know, so Tan has a character on the show too, Sir Afal added, her smirk widening as Issei's eyes widened. Want to see? Um, sure Issei was pretty sure it would hardly be salacious if Sir Afal's outfit was any indicator, but on the off chance after all, it was his job as Sona's fiancé to check. She was cute as a button in it. The skirt was short and blue, with a slightly longer white skirt draped across her rump. She also wore blue and black striped stockings, black opera gloves with white faux cuffs, black shoes with turquoise house, and a floppy blue hat with a white feather. That's just too cute, he said simply. I'm sure she still has it, Seraphil added blithely. You should ask her. Maybe later, Issei said, temporizing. It was tempting, especially considering how cute Sona got on the rare occasions that she was flustered. But somehow, it seemed like something to put a pin in. Think about it later, Sir Afal insisted, tugging him in the direction of the office. Come on, Ikin. Yes, Sir Ani, he said, letting out her resigned laugh. Maybe we'll get you a character on Miracle Levia Tan later, she added, and chuckled as it made him stumble. Is that what I think it is? Sona said, aiming the long bundle in Shizuku's arms. Perhaps, the Kyoto faction observer said cryptically. She turned her eyes towards Kaori, who was understandably surprised to see the Kendo club captain that is to say, her club captain present in the student council office. Good afternoon Murayama. Thank you for joining us. Sure, she said carefully, exchanging confused looks with Issei. The latter finished setting the teapot and cups on the table and sat next to his fiancé. So, but you, I assume you're not here about the regional competitions. 
I'm afraid not, Shizuku answered with gentle sardony. I'm here in my official capacity as the Kyoto Faction Observer. In many ways, Kuo is a hotbed for supernatural activity. It is also, however, on Japanese soil, which makes it important that the Shinto faction and its affiliates keep an eye on events here. I guess I can see that, the Kondoka agreed, her expression still slightly dubious. I'm still not completely sure what I'm present for, though. The Shinto faction, through its affiliates in Kyoto, is enacting a quiet non-aggression pact with the devils, specifically the houses of Sitri and Gremory, Rias explained. She sat on Sona's other side, sipping tea. Serafal Sama is here representing the four Mao. The Leviathan gave the knight a friendly wave, before assuming the threat of conversation. One of the provisos of that pact is that we take possession of an artifact that is in rather bad odor, in both Kyoto and Takamegahara. She spoke of the legendary home of the Shinto gods with utter sincerity, as if it were some place she'd visited occasionally on business. And this artifact has something to do with me? Kaori asked. Her eyes were slightly narrowed in wariness. It does, Sona said, her tone reassuring. The artifact itself isn't dangerous, unless used directly against a devil or fallen angel. She glanced meaningfully at Shizuku, who added, yes. The sword had had special enchantments laid upon it. Mureyama should have no problem wielding it. Sword. Kaori perked up slightly. The demonic sword she'd borrowed from Kiba's sword birth worked pretty well, but it wasn't as close to the feel of a katana as she would have preferred, and the Mureyama school of Kinjutsu didn't adjust as well to western blades as the Meguri school did. Yes. It's a Shinto holy sword, Yazorajiri, Shizuku explained, starting to unfurl the bundle. I don't think I've heard of that, Issei said. I'm not all that well versed in mythology, but still. That's because its true name has been forgotten, Shizuku elaborated. Or been deliberately suppressed. No one who's in a position to know it admits it. It's been informally known as Yazorajiri since Tsukiyomi Dono used it to kill Yukmachi Dono. Issei bobbled his cup, nearly dropping it. Kaori looked equally shocked. I that actually exists and you want to give that to me. It's been enchanted so it won't harm you to use it, or us, as long as the blade doesn't actually touch us," Serafal assured her. So Tan, Ria's Chan, and I oversaw the preparations ourselves last night. Ria's nodded in agreement. To be perfectly honest, I would have wanted it to go to Udo-kun, but he's not able to handle holy swords, and even if he were able to, he has good reason to refuse one. You are, mureyama san It's a powerful weapon. Shizuku, apparently, had decided to join in the coaxing. More than that, it gives its wielder command over shadows and the darkness. Can someone please explain a little more about holy swords? Issei asked. The way you guys are talking about them, they sound like WMDs in sword form. That's actually a fair approximation, Rhea said with a nod of agreement. More properly, that's the case for true holy swords, like the Excalibur or Durandal, or the divine swords of Shinto myth. Like that. She indicated Yazorajiri. They're the ultimate weapon against devils and fallen angels. And there are corollary demonic swords, which are equally deadly against angels. Kaori let out a breath, processing what she'd been told. She was aware of Issei's encouraging look, and of Sona's silent awareness of that. Once again, the sensation that the decision had been made, and was just waiting for the rest of her to catch up, flitted through her mind. Well, no point dawdling about it, then. Okay, she said aloud, fixing her face into a resolute expression. What do I need to do? Shizuku finished unwrapping the bundle. Inside laid a Tsurugi-style sword, its hilt wrapped in midnight blue silk. The blade rested in a scabbard several shades darker than the hilt wrapping, giving the impression of a deep, starless night. Go ahead and pick it up. If your will and skill are strong enough, the sword will take on a form better suited for you. She added, even if it doesn't, the sword should still accept you. Got it. Kaori lifted the sword with both hands, holding it in the middle of the scabbard. She held it for a moment, feeling a little silly, but then she felt a changing in her grasp. The scabbard grew and curved, and the hilt straightened and flattened slightly. After a moment, she was holding a katana, and one slightly longer than the norm. Somehow, in her hands, it felt light as a feather, almost as if crafted and balanced for her hands. Whoa, Kaori-san, Issei said softly, in an admiring tone. He didn't notice the surprised looks on Ria's or Shizuku's faces, or the faintly satisfied look on Sona's face. Kaori did notice those things, but they were of secondary importance at the moment. May I draw? She asked. Sona started to say yes, but paused as it became clear that her knight wasn't talking to her. After a moment, Kaori felt a sensation of ascent from the sword. She did her best to radiate a sense of gratitude back at it, stepped back to the unoccupied center of the room, and snapped through. The blade was a gleaming silver blue, the color of the full moon in winter, and that gleam wasn't figurative. There was a faint but noticeable glow, as if the blade had been forged from moonlight itself. Pretty, Issei said softly. 
Sona nodded distractedly and gave Shizuku a wry look. Tell me, Yagashi-san, how many Shinto holy swords does that make present in Kuo? Three, Shizuku said flatly. Wait, Issei interjected. The one you gave Kasan, this one, and... And mine, Shizuku finished. I think everyone would be more comfortable if I refrained from drawing Futsu no Matama, though. Three Shinto holy swords in Kuoria said sharply. And why is this the first I'm hearing of it? Because before this week, only mine was available to be used, Shizuku said calmly, sipping her tea. Aim no Ohabari only arrived the night before last, and Yuzorajiri was handed over to you for completion of the enchantments this last weekend. We understand, Serafal said quickly. But you'll understand our concerns. That's a not insubstantial redeployment of holy weapons. I would hope that our new pact would avoid anything that could be interpreted as an omission or misleading statement going forward. You're quite right. Shizuku looked towards Ria's and bowed respectfully. You have my apologies. We'll inform you promptly if something similar needs to happen again. Very well. Ria's didn't look fully mollified, but she nodded anyway. Hayori eyed Yuzorajiri, respectfully but warily, and carefully resheathed it. Holding it with the greatest of care, she offered Shizuku a deep bow. Thank you for entrusting me with this. I promise, I'll treat it with care. I have no doubt that you will. Shizuku returned the bow. What were you doing meeting with Sona-san? Kaki asked insistently. The two of them sat around her dining room table, their history homework laid out before them. Club business, Shizuku answered coolly, giving him a quizzical look. Ever since the revelation of Sitri San's engagement, her childhood friend had been strange. She was fairly certain he wasn't in love with the student council president, but he was developing an odd fixation on her relationship with Haidu Kun. It had to be Kaori, she thought. He had been similarly fixated on the way she'd been growing steadily closer to Nagumo Kun and had been similarly hostile towards him. It was also a known fact that Nagumo Kun and Haidu Kun had been friends. It was as if, in Kaki's mind, disrupting Sitri San's engagement would somehow make up for his inability to keep Kaori and Nagumo kun apart and for his inability to halt her disappearance. Not that it actually would, or, for that matter, that Nagumo kun had been a bad boyfriend for Kaori. Try telling that to Kaki, thought. Was Haidu there? Kaki pressed, his nostrils flaring. Not for the first time, Shizuku rolled her eyes. Just because she understood his reasoning, such as it was, didn't mean she agreed with it or would humor it any more than she absolutely had to. Of course he was, Kaki-kun, she said sternly. Drop it. We have actual work to do. I don't trust him, he muttered, a mulish expression on his face. Shizuku knew that look too well. It usually presaged him doing something stupid and embarrassing in the name of the right thing. Which all right, truth be told, there wasn't a trace of conscious malice in Amanagawa Kaki's body. There was also no trace, however, of self-reflection or ability to see things from another's perspective. How he saw things was how they were, and that was something neither Shizuku nor Kaki's parents had ever been able to shake him free of. Shizuku let out a long, exasperated sigh. Being his oldest friend could be trying enough. But there were the other reasons she had to keep him close the reasons that came down the line from Yasaka Dono. Azizel wasn't the only one who had been keeping quiet tabs on people with possible esoteric talents, at least on Japanese soil. And, if Yusaka Dono's guess was right. Well, Shizuku would continue hoping she wasn't, though. Sona-san isn't some helpless waif who needs you to come rescue her, Kaki-kun, she said sternly. And Haidu-kun isn't some Takisatsu monster. Now get your head together. All this stuff will be on the midterms. Kaki grumbled, clearly not believing her words. He hadn't believed that Kaori was a black belt, either, despite actually being in the judo class with her. He did, however, open his book. Shizuku watched him carefully, then opened her own notebook. Her eyes snapped to the window at the faint rumble of thunder. It's just a storm. It's been raining every day the last couple of weeks. Kaki's tone was oddly petulant about that. And, sadly, it was still the most sensible thing he'd said that afternoon. I hope so, she said softly. Saturday. So, it sounds like you've made some good progress with your sacred gear, Ajuka said pleasantly. He was sharing a booth with Sona and Issei at the local Gusto, and the three of them were picking over an appetizer platter. I guess, Issei said. I'm getting the hang of using it defensively to disarm opponents. What I really want is a way to weaponize it, though. Sona nodded in agreement, snagging an onion ring before Issei could. He retaliated by snapping up the last piece of courage. You'll get there, Issei-kun. Don't push yourself about it. Ajuka nodded encouragingly. Indeed. After all, you've only been a devil for a few weeks. No need to punish yourself for not making Balance Breaker yet. Issei raised an eyebrow. Balance Breaker. The fully evolved form of a sacred gear, Ajuka explained. A sacred gear in Balance Breaker is an order of magnitude more powerful than its normal form, often unlocking abilities that the normal form can't offer. 
He smiled slightly. I'm sure I could cite BPGs from several manga. Yeah, I think I can see what you mean. Issei wolfed down the courage, looking oddly thoughtful as he did so. He started to reach for his coke, then froze, his eyes widening. Tsonda beeped her head, looking at him carefully. Issei kun. He scrunched his eyes shut in concentration, his voice distracted. I think something to do with iron. Iron. Iron, Sona repeated, her brows knitting. Something Ferris, then. Yeah, Issei said in a distracted voice. Ferris project. His eyes snapped open, and he and Sona stared at each other. Her own eyes already showed recognition. That ridiculous anime he'd shown her, with the schoolgirl and her pocket change. Railgun, they blurted out simultaneously. Ajuka watched the two of them interestedly. It was unusual to see an engaged pair who were so in sync with each other. Aloud, he said, it's certainly possible. The easiest things to experiment with would be nails, Sona said thoughtfully. Ajuka-sama, would you care to join us on a trip to the hardware store? I didn't know the academy had a woodworking club, the old shopkeeper said amiably. We're new, Issei told him, feeling sweat trickling down the back of his head. He set the boxes of roofing nails. He closed his eyes for a moment, seeing if he could actually guesstimate how many nails there were in total. His eyes opened, and he was somehow unsurprised to have an exact number in his head. He said as much to Sona, and she shook her head in wonder. The Juka paid, and the three of them stepped outside, Issei carrying the heavy cloth grocery bag. The Mayu in charge of technology seemed quite pleased, and Issei told him as much. I enjoy watching bright people come up with creative solutions, Ajuka told him. To be frank, there are too many young high-class devils who just coast on their natural abilities. Not to name names. Oh, I think I know who you're thinking of, Sona replied sourly. You might. At any rate, it's easy to achieve when your abilities have obvious and flashy applications. What you're doing is the term thinking outside the box is so overused, but it's accurate in this case. Keep doing that, Issei Kun. That's how you'll make your name in devil society. Okay. Issei was slightly red now. I will. The student council convened at the abandoned mansion, around that very same brick wall used for combat training. At the last minute, the orc's president invited herself and her queen along. The general air was less one of a science experiment and more one of an impromptu party. Ika's geokinesis, bolstered by Momo and Ria's bishop talents, had been used to create a shelter again, this one surrounding the target practice brick wall and stretching back almost 30 meters. You were definitely generating an electromagnetic field, Ajuka said excitedly. He had an electromagnetic field detector in his hand and a radar gun sitting on the gym bag next to his feet. The latter device seemed to have been heavily modified. It's not a very strong one, but it's present. Try firing projectiles with it. Okay. Issei gathered up the bundles of roofing nails he and Sona has made earlier. There were around a hundred of them, twisted into bundles of six. Something about it seemed fitting, like they were bullets in a revolver's cylinder. He concentrated, just a little, and ten of the bundles were suddenly adhering to each arm. If this works, I'll need a more comfortable method of carrying ammo than this, he said absently. We'll come up with something, Sona assured him. There are magical storage spells or devices that duplicate the same. That'd be perfect. Issei enthused, then looked towards the R&D Mao. Ready. Ajuka picked up the radar gun and switched it on. He blinked and narrowed his eyes at what he was seeing on the display, then gave the device a solid smack. When he looked this time, he was far happier. He gave Issei a thumbs up. Goggles on. He called out cheerily. Not that they'd do much good if this worked but went terribly wrong, but it might make the healer's job a bit easier. Issei and the onlookers obediently donned their goggles. He took a deep breath, forming both hands into finger guns. Another moment of concentration, and one bundle on each arm shook off its ties and began to rotate slowly around each arm's hand, the point facing the same direction as the finger gun's barrels. The slow rotation of the nails made them look like the barrels of a Gatling gun. Once everyone else was clear, Sona flashed to say a thumbs up. He snapped his arms downward, leveling his finger guns and miming a firing motion. The clusters of nails snapped forward like tungsten-colored lightning, a staticky whipcrack echoing in the late night air. Issei's roofing nail bullet struck the wall with enough force and speed to gouge deep, tightly grouped holes into its surface, spiderwebbing the immediate surface surrounding the impact points. Issei clicked his tongue in disappointment. Damn it. I was hoping for more than that. You didn't do badly, Ajuka pointed out, turning the radar gun's display towards him. See, you came in close to the standard speed of a military-grade round. This would have done the job against most things. Yes, Sona agreed. He's right, Issei Kun. So are you, though. It's ineffective, but not much more so than a human firearm. In most respects, you do just as well with a Rekadan. Her tone left it unmistakable that she wouldn't let him use a human firearm, either. If you had a stronger electromagnetic field. 
wait. The three of them turned to look at Ria, who wore a thoughtful expression. You said that the sacred gear only generates a weak electromagnetic field. But, Ikun, you're doing okay with electrokinesis. Not as good as your pyrokinesis, but still. Could you use that to, maybe, boost the sacred gear's field? The Mayu, the Rook, and the King froze, staring at Ria wide-eyed. Issei recovered first, turning to Sona. Could that work? It's certainly worth a shot, Sona mused. At the very least, it wouldn't hurt. She couldn't help a soft chuckle. The name alone seems to suggest usefulness. Yes, I think it could work. Ajuka seemed to have perked back up. Goggles back on. Might want to kill our electronics, too, Tsubasa suggested. Until we have a better idea how much this thing will react with them. Good idea, Sona noted, turning off her phone. Around them, the rest of her and Rhea's peerages did likewise. This time, as he primed the projectiles, Issei called upon his lightning magic. The golden white electricity wreathed his forearms, skipping in and out of the visible spectrum. Was it just him, or were the projectiles actually turning faster now? That's much better. Ajuka called out, grinning at the radar gun's display. Sona gave the go-ahead again, and he mimed the firing motion again. That staticky whipcrack boomed like a thunderclap this time. In the relative confines of the shelter, it momentarily jarred everyone present. And this time, Issei's clusters of railgun projectiles punched two holes completely through the wall. They were the size of large dinner plates, overlapped into a large sideways eight, and stress fractures spiderweb throughout the wall's entire structure. Everyone present stared. Ria found her voice first, and her tone was chipper. See. Electrokinesis. No kidding, Issei said in amazement. Ria-san, you're a genius. Ria pinked cutely. Just pointing you in the right direction. You were halfway there already. Indeed. The electrokinesis did the trick, Ajuka agreed. And, Issei-kun, you'll be interested to know that, with it, your projectiles cleared the hypersonic threshold. Another thoughtful silence descended. Sona broke it first, this time. Very well done, Issei-kun. And you, Ria. Let's keep working at it, and then we'll see about dinner, and break for the night. You're full of surprises, Haidu-kun, Ria said admiringly. Bearing a neolonginess is one thing, but improvising a technique like this is remarkable. Issei-kun is a man of many talents, Sona agreed coolly. There was just a hint of casual possessiveness in her voice, and Issei beamed as he heard it. This is turning into a real party, huh? Kaori remarked to Aika. So much for training. Someone should have at least brought pizza. Don't bring it up, unless you want to be the one paying for it, Aika advised. Ryo watched the two of them, and how their eyes kept darting to Issei. She smiled to herself. If nothing else, it looked like her son was surrounding himself with good friends. And somehow, she had a feeling it wouldn't stay at nothing else. Oh, we'll be making Chinese-style hot pot out here, she said aloud. She waved a hand, indicating the large cloth grocery bags and folding table she'd had Goru cart out to the mansion. I'm used to making dragon-sized portions. The coon mentioned that you taught him to cook shabu-shabu, I commused, beeping her head in thought. Yes, I did, Ryo answered. Both Goru Kun and Akun have always had large appetites. She gave Aika a good-natured smirk as she repeated the nickname. Much later, Kaori would mention that she'd never actually seen the other girl blush before that very moment. Give me a hand with unpacking these, would you? You'll get first dibs in exchange. Eel, both girls said, clearly in a hurry to move things along. Kaori quickly unfolded the table and started to empty the bags. How are we getting along here? Goru asked, coming up behind Ryo and resting a hand on her shoulder. Just fine. Ryo said this with a sly smile that made both devils eye her with polite wariness. Issei and Sona approached, hand in hand, followed by Ajuka, Ria's, and the rest of Sona's peerage. The former looked slightly winded, but very pleased with himself. None of the nail packets that he'd put together earlier were anywhere to be seen, indicating that he'd expended them all in testing. Sona looked pretty pleased as well, and Ryo had a feeling that they'd be discussing it more even after they returned home. She'd always known her son was smart, but the way he thrived since encountering the supernatural world spoke as to his true potential. Good job, Issei. It's a very clever attack. At this rate, you won't even need to get close to your opponents now. Smart boy, Goru agreed. A dragon should never be afraid to get up close and personal, but you should never be dumb enough to do it unless absolutely necessary. The rook rubbed the back of his neck, his face turning slightly red. Heh, thanks. Still gotta work on refining this, though. The important thing is that you've demonstrated the concept's viability, Sona told him. It'll just take practice to smooth off the rough edges. She gave him a knowing smile. I assume you have a name in mind for this attack already. Railgun, Issei admitted. What else? Boss Dragon has a nice ring to it, Ika interjected as she helped unpack the food. It does, but I'd rather save that for something bigger, Issei replied. 
How much bigger do you expect? Kaori asked curiously. Well, if I could manage to do this in dragon form as same used. Sacred gears respond readily to their bearer's will and desire, Sona told him. It's entirely possible that you can find some way to do that. Maybe Issei trailed off, starting to slide into silent thought. Tsubasa chose that moment to slap him on the back, congratulating him on being a gunslinger rook. That set him off chattering, and before long the entire earthen shelter was full of cheerful chatter, as many hands made light work of the meal prep. In the end, it was the most successful dinner party Ryo had hosted in a long time. Another week passed, and did so with surprising quiet. Kaori worked hard at acclimating to Yazorajiri and its qualities, while Lisei worked on refining Railgun. Sona's peerage, as a whole, worked at honing their teamwork and coordination, and Asia became even more socially entrenched in and beloved by Kuo's student body. All in all, it was a remarkably peaceful stretch of time, and Sona began to tentatively hope that it would last a while. When things went south that Saturday, she wanted to kick herself. It would figure, she thought ruefully, that it had happened on the first semi-clear day in almost two weeks. Asia-san, why don't you join the track team? Amanagawa Kaki asked. The two of them were standing in one of the covered walkways, where he'd stopped her on her way to the student council office. A half day, as every other Saturday was, the student body was already streaming towards the school gates, eager to make use of a non-rainy afternoon. Um, thank you, Amanagawa-senpai, but I don't really have an interest in the track team, Asia said hesitantly. She wasn't sure why he'd made a point of pigeonholing her after the last bell, but here they were anyway. Issei-sen had told her a few things about the senpai well, it was more that he had complained loudly about him, and Sona-sen had agreed with him. I really think you should consider it, Amanagawa said, smiling brightly. It was clear he meant it as a friendly gesture, but it came across as patronizing. It was like many of the senior priests in the church had been. The good intentions were there, but they were so wrapped up in condescension and self-satisfaction. I'm the team captain, and I can tell you we have a good group of people. It'll be good for you to make a wider circle of friends. Thank you, but right now I think I'm happy with the friends I've made through Issei Sand, Asia replied. She winced inwardly as she saw the senpai's face cloud over. Haidu Amanagawa spoke the surname as if it were distasteful, and shook his head disapprovingly. I don't trust him, Asia Sand, and neither should you. He's a bad influence. You really shouldn't be living with him. He's always been perfectly well behaved around me, Asia replied, her expression innocent. She might have been unworldly, but that did not equate to stupid, it was impossible to grow up in church service without learning to conceal one's true feelings behind a smile. And I've seen him and Sona sent together. They definitely seem to be in love. There was the faintest note of reproach in her voice as she said the last part. The fact was evident to anyone who would look which, she had to admit, seemed to be a minority at the school. The Managawa shook his head again, and the patronizing nature of it was even stronger this time. Clearly, he didn't care to look or was convinced already saw what needed to be seen. You and Sona-san are both too kind with him. He'll only take advantage of it. Oh, I wouldn't worry about that any longer, a sneering male voice said before Asia could retort. Both she and Amanaga would turn to stare at the conversation's unexpected third party. He was a rangy, athletic man dressed in the clothes of a church exorcist and a rather worn-looking set at that. His grayish white hair was in an uneven bowl cut, and his face was set in a sneer, one that matched the smug look in his Sarah's eyes. Also, there was the small fact of the gun he had clutched in one hand. It was a long, chunky semi automatic, straddling the line between pistol and sawed off shotgun in size. Despite its length and bulk, he handled it as easily as if it were a toy. He had what looked like a massive sword in an equally massive scabbard, but that didn't seem the important thing at present. How did you get onto the campus? Amanagawa blurted out. It was a stupid question, but Asia couldn't help wondering the same thing. Don't worry, no one died. The man in exorcist robes chuckled. If you cooperate, it'll stay that way. Understand. He brandished the handgun meaningfully. Hey, guns are illegal. Amanagawa blurted out and then folded nearly in half as the exorcist, or was he? Asia had heard stories about exorcists being driven out of the church for well, exactly why it tended to be hushed up, drove the weapon's muzzle into his gut. He sank to his knees, groaning in pain. You don't say, the man said, that sneer still in his voice. Come on, Asia, it's time to come with me. Something clicked in Asia's memory. The look Rainer had given her, the mention of a price to be paid. You're the one who was supposed to meet us in Latvia, she said hesitantly. Very good, Asia, he said with a mocking bow. It's time to come with me now. I refuse, she said flatly. I'm staying in Kuo. Bold of you to assume you have a choice, he said, tone thoughtful. Next thing Asia knew, she was on the ground, gingerly touching her cheek. The barrel of the gun hadn't been swung with quite enough force to break anything, but it surely hurt like the devil. 
The odd thought occurred to her that most of the devils she'd met over the last month had been far kinder towards her than most people associated with the church. She wondered what the Lord would have said to that. Now, be a good girl, the man said, as if he'd done nothing more than waggle a finger sternly at her. He reached down, yanking her to her feet. Stop both of them turned in surprise to see Amanagawa pushing to his feet, groaning in pain. Leave Asia Sen alone he took a swing at Selzin, who sidestepped it with a smirk. He then whirled around, yelling as he took another swing. This time, the punch had far greater power behind it, and for a moment, what looked like a red armored glove seemed to spark into existence around the fist, just long enough for spiked metal to drive into Selzin's gut. It was the rogue exorcist's turn to double over, coughing up blood. Still, he was too experienced a combatant to go down so easily, and his pistol whipped up and around. Amanagawa went down again, his nose shattered this time. The gauntlet that had briefly appeared around his hand vanished, gone back to wherever it had manifested from. Aren't you interesting, the exorcist mused as he straightened back up, little the worse for wear. Another sacred gear user. Maybe he's our ticket out of this town. He smirked at Asia. The two of you are coming with me. Fix his nose and your cheek, now. I don't want to come with you, Asia insisted, and despite the tears rolling down her cheeks, her eyes were firm. Again, I'm not giving you a choice. But, if you need an incentive the pistol's barrel swung back towards Amanagawa, and she heard a faint click. Fix yourselves and come with me, or I'll kill him. And anyone else who approaches. Asia sighed and knelt next to Amanagawa. Two identical silver rings, each one bearing a blue-green gemstone, appeared on her hands. She took a deep breath, and her hands began glowing a soft green. She held one hand to her left cheek and the other to Amanagawa's broken nose. At once, the ache subsided from her face, and she could see the pain leave her senpai's eyes as the healing magic took hold. Asia-san. He said confusedly. It's all right, she said in the most reassuring tone she could muster. Don't worry, he said with a pseudo-drunken earnestness. I'll protect you. I'm sure. Again, Asia was sure he meant well, but she had to fight the urge to roll her eyes. This is all something NNGH to do with Haidu, isn't it? Amanagawa added, the judgmental expression from earlier returning to his face. Now that he was healed, his assumption that he was in control of the situation reasserted itself, despite the evidence to the contrary. I told you he's trouble, Asia-san. This time, Asia did roll her eyes. No, senpai, she said with a sigh as she finished healing him. This has to do with my past. The first that Sona realized something was wrong was when Asia didn't appear after school. She had made a habit of hanging out during student council meetings ever since it was established that she was supernaturally aware and her cheery presence tended to be a bomb for her peerage. Certainly Asay was starting to get agitated the longer she was absent. He had fallen into the older brother role almost too easily. He had just pulled out his phone to text her when the door opened. That was unusual to happen without a knock unless it was Riazor a member of her peerage. Chizuku stepped through, looking quizzical. Sorry to bother you. I was wondering if you'd seen Kaki-kun. Why would we have seen him? Issei asked in bemusement. He told me he was going to convince Asia Sen to join the track team, the kendo club captain explained. And I know she generally hangs out with you after school. We haven't seen either of them, Sona said slowly, sitting up in her chair. She exchanged looks with Issei, that same agitation he was clearly feeling was now nagging at her. Tsubasa burst into the room, followed closely by Momo and Raruko. The bishop was holding out her phone. We've got trouble, she said. Some maniac with a sword is loose downtown. Sona, Issei, and Shizuku exchanged looks. It was, of course, entirely possible that Amanagawa and Asia's absences had nothing to do with a sword-wielding maniac. Not that they believed that for a moment. Sona looked at the phone, which had a video playing on the local news station's website. It was clearly from a store or restaurant's external security camera and showed a wild-eyed man in ragged-looking exorcist's clothing, wielding a large, exotic-looking sword that had a disturbingly wet and reddish glint along its cutting edge. She winced as she saw the local uniformed cops try to order him to surrender. He acted before she could feel more than a momentary spike of distressed sympathy, and their bodies hit the pavement, already bleeding out. The sneer never left his lips, and the fact that it was a video-only clip just emphasized the intensity of the scene. The clip ground to an abrupt halt as the apparent exorcist put around through the camera's lens. It lasted long enough, though, for them to see behind a pair of teenagers huddled behind the murderer, looking bruised and miserable, but mostly intact. Asia Chan, Issei whispered, at the same time that Shizuku said Amanagawa's first name in a dismayed tone. Sona sighed. This was a mess. She summoned a communication circle. Riaz. Something's happened. Can you come over? I think I know. Riaz sounded grim. I'm on my way. Who the hell is Selzin? Sona turned her laptop so the others could see the photo. 
He was a rangy man of indeterminate age, with white silver hair and a jagged bowl cut in Sarah's eyes, and an expression that was not even within shouting distance of sane. This is him. Fried Selzen is a rogue exorcist, formerly employed by the Vatican. And, more recently, formerly employed by Grigori. That's not what I can a reassuring resume, Tsubasa commented sourly. It's not supposed to be. As a person, he's revolting. Psychopath, rapist, serial killer. Must have fit right in at the Vatican. Sona gave the pawn an unusually sharp look. That's not funny, Ika. Sorry, sorry. Ika seemed genuinely contrite. Anyway. My point is that, for all his personality flaws, he's a frighteningly capable combatant. He specializes in close combat, particularly with swords, but he's also a good marksman. As much as I hate to admit it, he's more than a match for any single newly reincarnated devil. I don't want anyone traveling alone. We move in pairs, at least. More if possible. So he came here for Asia. Issei looked murderous, and Kaori didn't look much calmer. Sona could hardly blame them. Asia was a very easy girl to like, and Sona had grown used to the idea of having her as an unofficial sister-in-law. That's what the report says, Sona explained, her tone almost too calm. Grigori was very forthcoming when one Isama contacted them. Rainer may still refuse to crack, but one of her associates was more reasonable. She decided it was better not to reflect on what Grigori might consider proper procedure to persuade someone to reasonability. Rainer was apparently dangling her in front of him as a combined tame medic sex slave. Bitch. Several members of Sona's peerage looked askance at Issei, surprised by the sheer vitriol he packed into the single obscenity. Kaori, Aika, and Ria did not. After all, they'd also had first-hand dealings with the fallen angel in question. I couldn't agree more. Sona's tone was softer, but her expression wasn't. Rainer wasn't going to earn her forgiveness anytime soon. This new wrinkle only made it easier to hate her. Tsubaki cleared her throat. So Selzin is officially disavowed, then. Yes. Both Grigori and the Vatican have declared him persona non grata, and the Orthodox and other churches won't touch him. And Shizuku-sen has passed on Kyoto's judgment regarding him. In Yusaka-sama's words, he's all yours. He's as legal a target as they get. A soft, approving sound arose from the assembled devils. They were neither bloodthirsty nor sadistic, as a matter of course. But there was a certain satisfaction in the thought of freed cells in meeting a violent death. Sona reflected that she should probably try and rein her peerage's collective urges in. But, truth be told, she shared it. Some people most benefited the world by absenting themselves from it. Fried Selzin was one such person. How are we going to locate them? Tsubaki asked. I'll take care of that, Ria said, producing a communication circle. Gasper. It's but you. This is a top priority assignment, so you can let any other contracts you currently have lapse. Yes, but you, a youthful androgynous sounding voice replied. We need access to all the CCTV cameras in the metropolitan area, Rias explained. You told me you already have backdoors installed. Yes, but you, but I haven't tested all of them, the voice said in a temporizing tone. This will test them, Rias assured him. You're going to be looking for these three people she pulled out her phone, sending Gasper photos of Asia, Amanagawa, and Selzin. She has a hacker on peril. Issei whispered excitedly to Sona. Of sorts. He's her bishop. I don't think he's quite as gifted a programmer as you, though, Sona replied in a similar tone. Perhaps she can arrange a meeting after this is over. Probably good for us to compare notes, Issei said with a nod. He then shook his head hard, chagrined at letting himself get distracted. I have matches, Gasper replied promptly. The most recent ones are timestamped 15 minutes ago on the southeastern side of Kuo. He seems to be headed for the town's outskirts, in the direction of the abandoned mansion. The bishop rattled off latitude-longitude numbers, while Lisei and Sona pulled up a map of the Kuo metropolitan area. From the camera footage, Asia-san and Amanagawa-san looked basically all right, but bloodied. Lisei growled softly, and Sona squeezed his arm. Concentrate, she told him softly, marking the aforementioned area on the interactive map. After a moment, she said thoughtfully, are they on foot or in a vehicle? All the footage I'm seeing shows them on foot, Gasper answered after a moment. Hmm. Sona studied the map, then traced a roughly circular area around the last confirmed sighting. The total area had a roughly 20-block diameter. Rias, I'm making a formal request of the devil governor of Kuo to treat this area as enemy territory for purposes of promotion. Granted, Rias said promptly. Sona inclined her head in respectful thanks, then turned towards her peerage. We're deploying now. Ria, you're with me. We'll start here. She indicated the center of the zone. Tsubaki, take Momo and Aika. If you have a chance, Aika, you may promote. The three of you will start here. She indicated the uppermost corner of the delineated area. Tamo, Tsubasa, I want you two starting here. Left corner of the area. 
Saji Kun, Raruko, start here. You have my permission to promote if the opportunity presents itself. Right corner. Finally, Issei Kun, Kaori, I'd like you two to start here. Bottom corner. Her servants nodded, and she gave them an approving nod in return. Her eyes locked with Issei's for a moment, and she saw mirrored in them the determination and worry and care that she felt. She couldn't feel prouder of him or of the rest of her peerage. Move out. End of the here. So that's it for today's video guys, before you go just like the video and share it with your friends. Bye.